Essaye de t'asseoir quelque part dans ta pièce. Ok. Genre, si je sois là, et que tu t'assois à ta... Ouais, full, full, ça marche trop bien, là. Ouais, mais moi, je suis... Là, t'es en moins, non, un peu T'es en quoi T'es pas un peu en moins Non, moi, ça... Attends. Moi, ça va. Ah, attends, alors, moi, je me décale. Hop, et là, je me regarde un peu. Non, je m'avance. Voilà. Ouais, okay. attends, je m'approche, je me mets un bras autour. Attends, est-ce que tu peux te reculer un peu, toi, ou pas Ouais, ouais. Ah oui C'est malade. <rire> Donc, comment qu'il y a Et un petit thé, un petit café. Oh. Allô, ouais. Comment ça va Je peux t'embrasser. <rire> Je crois qu'on est plus bien calé sur les images. <rire> ouais. Oh, Je t'ai tellement choupi. Oh bah alors Là, tu ne vois plus ta main. Là, je peux voir. Ah, ça peut toucher. Ah, ça peut toucher. Bah alors. Oh. Tu as vu me donner la main Bah si, mais... Mais j'ai pas bu de bière ou de joint avant. <rire> Quoi Ah Tu peux toucher ouais, ton genou comme ça. Oh non. Tu peux toucher ton genou. Oh non. Il faut qu'on se rapproche. Oh wow. Oh, oh, oh. On est proche, proche, là là. Proche, proche, proche. Genre si je touche ton genou comme ça. Oh, une main sur mon genou. Mais bah, voyons. Mais attends, il y a un film à voir, là. il y a un film à voir. Il faut se concentrer sur le film. Non. Oh. Ouais, ouais, tu passes ta main derrière la tête et tout, là, mais... <rire> ah, c'est trop mignon. Penche ta tête. C'est comme si tu étais dans le creux de mon épaule. J'aimerais pas. Oh, tu veux passer ton bras derrière moi Oui. Oh, 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 oh. <rire> Je peux t'embrasser Oui. Tu veux m'enlever une pelle Oui. Je prends une grosse pelle. Tu <rire> t'aimes Et tout Putain, c'est malade ce truc. Voilà, on a fait genre. Euh... La fille dans l'écran euh, puissance 1000, quoi. <rire> c'est malade, en vrai. C'est très sympa. Tu Mais tu sais, c'est... Bah, en fait, c'est genre... C'est très cool, mais c'est weird, parce que du coup, t'es dans l'ordi, et puis après, t'es là, t'es en mode, bah non, en fait, est... Emma est pas là, genre. Exactement. C'est exactement ce que j'ai dit à Léa ce matin. Genre, le fait de pas avoir une présence physique ouais. fait que c'est vraiment bizarre. Ouais, c'est... Ouais, c'est un peu oui, genre. Mais c'est très sympa. C'est très... Mais je pense que c'est un peu un... Bah, un truc qu'on a déjà fait par téléphone, c'est par... Bah, quand on s'appelle et tout. Et là, je pense que c'est encore puissance 1000, parce que comme on est vraiment... On se voit, puis on est proche et tout, quoi. Puis, euh... puis on se voit en entier sur des écrans. On se voit pas sur nos écrans avec lesquels on se signe, tu vois. Ouais. Du coup, c'est ouf. Mais c'est vrai que c'est un, peu... ouais, un peu bizarre, ouais. Parce que là, je, en plus, là, je m'imagine un peu à Champigny, tu vois. Ouais. Et je sais que je suis là, quoi, puis je suis en genre... Ah, yeah. Je pense que effectivement ça change un peu quand tu connais l'espace. Ouais, je pense. Parce que moi, je connais pas ouais. l'espace de ton appartement, et du coup, ça me fait pas trop ça. Ouais, ça fait pas trop ça, ouais. Mais quand tu m'as dit, viens sur le sofa, je suis en mode, ben oui <rire> J'arrive <rire> wow Ouais. Et voilà. Mais c'est bien, on fait... Euh... C'est très cool d'expérimenter ça, c'est très chouette. Un petit frisson de toi dans mon cou, là. Mmh. Mmh. Oh. Oh, oh, là. Quand tu passes ta main comme ça dans tes cheveux. Mmh. Quand tu passes ta main dans tes cheveux, je fonds. Mmh. 
Non, et toi donc <rire> ah, J'ai fait son, j'ai la petite vulva. C'est où <rire> T'es en PLS Hein T'es en PLS Ouais, un peu. Puis je pense c'est genre PLS des... des émotions, la concentration sur l'ordi, et en même temps la réalité qui est là, c'est trop bizarre. Ouais. C'est bizarre parce que plus on discute et plus je me projette dans l'écran. Ouais, exactement. Ouais, puis je pense que vraiment le fait de s'asseoir aussi, ouais. tu me... Enfin, c'est... Genre danser, ça va, tu sais, on peut, ben, genre ça marche, là, mais je pense que le fait de, de se voir proche et côte à côte, je me dis, wesh, là... <rire> T'es là Ah, là, là, là c'est un peu vertigineux, cette Ah, là, non <rire> Ah, pas de mots, en fait <rire> Genre, si je me laisse tomber dans tes bras, je tombe. <rire> oh, ouais, mais pareil. Oh, oh. Ah oh. Je te sens dans mon trou. Ouais. Walking alone at night, honestly, something that I've been doing for years, and it'd be like, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and I would just, like, you know, leave, and I would just walk about, and feel like, okay, I'm done. If that, like, reminds me, My name is Tony. My name is Greta. Hello, oh, I'm Sam. Lisa. My name is Franz. I'm Daria. And my name is Yuval. So what should I say about the housing problem? That we're basically homeless. 
uh, also part of the housing crisis. I'm living in Maastricht, which is an hour train away, 20 euros each way. It's really expensive. I live still in Rotterdam and I have to travel every day. It definitely is a struggle. The train stopped running after 12. Uh, it's been really hard finding a place. This is our third time moving. Every time we move to a different Airbnb, and it's super expensive. I wrote messages to maybe like 40 different listings and they all gave me the same answer. I wasn't chosen for a viewing. Uh, everything on Facebook and common net and everything, every website I could find and uh, still didn't find anything. How, how am I supposed to find a place if there's like so many other people doing the same? Mm. It's frustrating. I think a home for me is a place where I can contemplate on the things I went through each day. Right now it's just a rooftop. Like loving people, when loving people surround you. Just a bed, somewhere to sleep, somewhere to shower. But you know, a home is really somewhere where you can come back to and feel safe. My name is Rosalie Brambok. I'm from uh, a small town near Eindhoven in the Netherlands. I stay here for like one year. It's a bit too tiny for me. I feel the most home when I'm away because you've got so much less to lose. My name is Ben. I'm half French, half English. Moved from the UK uh, to Eindhoven uh, in mid-August. Yeah, so there's a, there's a shed in uh, in the garden of the house that I've been staying in, uh, but it's been used as a dumping ground for all manner of things. Uh, it's full of junk, uh, but also the shed itself doesn't have a door and it's not insulated. A home is where. like that, so to speak, but it's not nearly as widespread as it should be. Yeah, but I feel like you can get a little creative. Flooding really is the answer. There are plenty of places, there's building sh shortage of places to stay, they just don't want to rent it to students. <laughs> help us! <laughs> Please help us! <laughs> Someone! <laughs>
Did you do this? This is low even for you. What did he do, Jiffy? He fucking knew. He knew the entire climate catastrophe 26 years ago. What was that? Do not pull that shit on me. You heard me. Uh, she said you knew about the climate catastrophe. <sighs> Just that old argument again. One day, I swear to God, I will finish you, Dad. <laughs> That's her mom's side showing. Always going on about the environment. Who cares? Oil has always been and will always be the future. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, imagine racing with electric cars. Hyundai! I thought more of you than this. Shit, I'm late. You have not heard the last of this, Dad. Real bad timing for this story to break. I want Miss Green to see my best side tonight. I bet this will cloud the entire evening. <laughs> Green? That's Jiffy's bombshell of a mother. She just cares about polar bears and coral reefs. What about profit, huh? You know we got a date tonight? Over the years she's become harder to get, so I'll have to convince her with the green transition. <laughs> Did you see this? Econ's oil pipes are in the news. The whole neighborhood is pissed and the police is running an investigation. We finally got him. Wait. They can't trace it back to us, right? Of course they can. How smart do you think you are? Don't listen to him, Hyundai. No one will ever know. Yeah, Shelly and Hyundai have been harassing Ekon ever since he moved into the neighborhood a few years back. Don't know how Shelly convinced Hyundai to do it, but they're in it together now. I just don't understand how no one has caught them yet. I mean, they're far from professionals. Shelly, this time he is taking it too far. I'm contacting him the police. Blowing up my precious oil pipes, are we? I'll drown him in his own medicine. Hey, Dexley, how are you? Shelly, you have to come down here. They're revolting. What, who is? All of them. They even got Kitty Cat on board. Treacherous little fucks. Hold on a moment. What do they want? Clean water. They're demanding it's a human right. They should be happy with their employee discount. I give them 50%. 50%? What more can they expect? Listen, I can't help you. I have a date with Miss Green and need to prepare the cleanup act. Do you know anyone? Does it look like I know someone? I don't know. Ask Apple or whoever. I got better things to do. Thanks for nothing. Epley, he said. Good call, Nextly, good call. What can I say? Chi is the best in town. She styled me good back when the whole child labor story broke. Nothing anyone thinks about now, is it? I could not ask for a better PR expert. You're too kind, Apley. I just do my job, which I'm very good at. Anyway, when Shelly called, I thought, why not? Always good to have some favors to pull later. Right. Everything off. Here. Hey you, kiddo. The old man does not seem to be able to undress himself. Help out. Right. Shelly, she seems to know what she's doing. You must be Chia, head of Epley's PR, marketing. <sighs> yes. I really do not have all day. Hyundai, nice to meet you, racing driver. Cars, huh? I didn't know we were back in the 1900s. Fossil dependency and all that shit. Yeah, that seems to fit. Good, then everything else will as well. Right. The rest will arrive tomorrow. Curtains, floors, the whole thing. By the weekend, this whole thing will be long forgotten. BTW, you will have to do something about that story that came out this morning. It is not a good look. I'll figure it out. I don't care what you do. Just a shame to throw away my work. Gotta go. Damn.
what just happened? You just missed... What was her name? Calm down. She's called Shia. You would be a terrible match. You heard her opinion on cars. I can go electric. Do you realize where you live? No one goes electric in this house. But the change of clothes and all the talk of a green future. I have a date tonight, Hyundai. Did you think all of this was for real? Well, maybe if you bought it, Miss Green could be convinced as well. Koi? Well, I had to kill his parents when he was a kid. Couldn't be helped. Felt bad for him, so took him in. Of course no one told him the truth. Huh. Funny you would decide on change of clothes the same day as my test on corporate greenwashing. Did you plan this before you knew the climate story would come out or after? I will have a serious chat with your teachers. Brainwashing the youth to believe fake news. What has the world gone to? If I'm a good father, definitely. You should see the trust fund I have in her name. Massive. Not my fault, that means zero tax. I'm calm, understanding, yeah. Shelly, over here, please. No need for ID. Know anything of breaking pipes over at your neighbor Econ's house? Of course you do. We know what you did the other night, but we need to hear you say it. Excuse me, officers, but I know nothing of this. Econ, you said? Hey, Chubby, know anything about this? Fuck you. And of course he did it. No need for things to get heated. As we said, we already know everything. You just have to deny for the record. Wait, what? You're letting him go? Listen, we know everything that led up to this, and it's not our job to interfere with neighborhood disputes. Some will say it was one way, others another. We accept all sides of the story. But you are the police. It's your job to figure the truth. Fat and annoying, huh? You better shut up or I'll silence you myself. We just need to have a look around for the sake of protocol. Will that be a problem? No, not at all. Help yourselves. Who wants drugs? <laughs> just kidding, of course. Bad timing, Pardew. No need to hide it, we know. Just do your thing and don't mind us. Uh, sure. Shelly? Uh, same as last week? Double dose of OxyContin? Yeah, perfect. Been feeling great on it. Happy to hear it, champ. Never let a customer, uh, a patient, down. Anyone else need something? And if that's all, I'll be on my way. Crypto. No trace, right, Shelly? Right. The Purdue guy? Of course it was me you gave Nextel the idea. Started out as a joke between us. Well, now he's hooked. If I took it too far, I did nothing he wouldn't have done. So no, no regrets. Seems like we're done here. Nothing out of the ordinary. You are just going to look the other way when someone sells drugs right in front of you? Not even mention it? You must be the worst officers I ever met. Careful now, dear. My brother already warned you. He can become very unpleasant if you provoke him. One last thing. I'm sure you know of that uh, climate story that broke this morning. Is there anything you could possibly do to silence it? I'll pay whatever. Consider it done. Let's hope this works, huh? Not waiting at the door. Have you lost your manners along with your drilling rights, Shelley? Just uh, opening the wine. Organic, I hope? 
Where is Jiffy? She said she wanted to talk with me about something. Jiffy? She's out with Hyundai. I'm sure it can wait. Wine? Thanks. So, what's this new style about? I wanted to be the first one to tell you. I'm going green. <laughs> and you want me to believe that? You might be able to fool some stupid journalists, but I know you. There is no chance you are serious about this. And here I was, thinking you would see how sincere I am about it. Don't be such a bore. You just have to prove it. Which shouldn't be hard if you are serious. You will see. Cheers. Cheers, Shelly. I admit, the green does look good on you. No way he is sincere about this. You heard about Koi's parents? Then you know how far he has gone before. I wish I knew what I see in him. Opposites attract, I guess. But that is all in the past now. In fact, I'm dating Amnesty. Now, we share a lot of values, you know? And then, then, when the oil is fully phased out, there will be only green alternatives left. Wind, solar, and we will be right at the frontier. It does sound like you have thought this through, I must say. Who would have guessed? Oil man number one transitioning. I told you, this is for real. Not just some green facade to improve public opinion. I'm serious. So, will you sell your Jeep? I saw it still outside. Actually, someone will come around and pick it up tomorrow. Of course I'm not selling that car. I love it more than Jiffy. It causes less troubles as well. But she's buying it. Thank God the officers could make the story disappear. That would have destroyed all my credibility. Hey there, miss. Hey, mister. He is unbelievable. On the couch? Gross! Well, Mom didn't stay for breakfast. She was way too upset with herself. I just don't get how she missed the climate scandal yesterday. It must have been all over the place. At least now she knows. I just hope she does not leave the country for another charity project. Ah, and there it is. Mozambique. Great. All right. Oh, wow. I'm on. Okay. Yeah. If you're interested in video games, please come along now to the center stage. And I'm going to present to you today my video game, Sindigo. So now it's going to come up on the screen. All right. Here we go. Hi. My name is Luca. And this is the project that I'm going to show you today, my video game, Sindigo. 
Sindago is a narrative-driven role-playing game where you play as the mayor or, of a small town in southern Italy. And the decisions that you make and the relationships that you build will have long-lasting consequences on the rest of your game. In my work, I'm always trying to tell a story, and Sindaco is the story of a small town that changes and develops, um, not just based on your wishes, but the wishes of the people around you. In this game, your people aren't just numbers on a screen, they are people with their own hopes and wants. And managing this successfully will spark progress in your town. Fail to do so, and you will lose control. So this game is heavily inspired by my own heritage. My family is from a very similar town in southern Italy. And uh, that has changed massively over the years due to various factors like corruption, organized crime. And these are all things that we're going to see our Sindaco deal with today. And here's our Sindaco here. Here is the character that you will play as if you play the game. And he's the mayor of our town. And today we start in the municipio, or the town hall. Um, and this is the place uh, that we always go back to to make decisions and uh, change things in our town as the mayor. So this is the first uh, instance of the mechanic that we can use in the game to mainly interact with the people, and that's the conversation mechanic. In your conversation mechanic, you can go up to people, you can have conversations with them, and as you can see in that short conversation there, we have multiple responses to each conversation, allowing you to role-play a little bit as the scene looker, but also change the plotline of your game depending on who you talk to and what you say to them. So now we've had our first conversation, uh, we're still in the municipio, but we're going to go now into our town and we're going to go check out uh, our community. So this is our town, um, it's a fictional uh, town uh, in sort of southern Italy, uh, heavily inspired by the places that I grew up in when I was a child. And there's our friend Cristobaldo there, he's our assistant, and he's the character that our player can always go back to uh, and have a chat with to figure out what to do next. So there's always a way to understand how to progress in the game if you're confused. So right now we're going to go talk to Cristobaldo, and Cristobaldo is going to introduce to us the first two characters that we'll get to interact with today. And those two characters are Don Lothario, who is the head of a mafia family, and Maria Rosaria, who is a sort of southern Italian woman, uh, primarily concerned with the well-being of the town itself. So Cristobaldo has told us that uh, Don Lothario wants to talk to us, so we're going to go uh, over to the bar here, and we're going to go have a chat with him. There he is right there, this man with the moustache. And we're going to have a chat with him and uh, see what he has to say. So in this first level, um, our conversations with the people are mainly about getting to know them, understanding who they are, their role within the town, and their relationship to us, the, the mayor. So as you can see in this conversation, we have two options, so two replies that we can give him. And these two replies would take us on two very different kinds of conversations. So the first option uh, is a more hostile option. If we click that, then we're going to discover that these two characters maybe don't like each other that much um, because our syndico opposes Don Lothario and his mafia family. However, in this case, we've actually chosen the second option, which is a friendlier approach. And in so doing, we can discover that these two characters know each other before the game started, so kind of off camera, so to speak. And they have a relationship together, they know each other's families. And um, in this first level, I really wanted to bring that forward of how these characters know each other on a very personal level. Because in these kind of communities, street politics is such an important part of how the community runs. And those street politics are so important because people know each other on a very intimate, personal level. So the decisions that we take in this game aren't just going to affect our town, but they're actually also going to affect the people in it. We're going to annoy certain people and please certain people by choosing different things as we progress through the story. So right now we've had a chat with Don Lothario, and now we're going to go talk to Maria Rosaria who is our sort of quintessential southern Italian woman. She knows everyone in the town, she's a gossip, which is super helpful for us, because she gives us really good information. Um, and her main concern is to protect the community and to look out for the people that she's sort of watched grow up, and uh, is, she has a very emotional connection to the people of the town. So I created these two characters, Don Lothario and Maria Rosaria, to be kind of the opposites of each other. Where Don Lothario is concerned with making money for himself and his mafia family, Maria Rosaria is concerned with the well-being of the people. And because they oppose each other on their basic interests, what we choose is ultimately going to upset one or upset the other. We can't really please everyone in this town, in this particular storyline. 
So right now, we've had a conversation with our two characters. We've met them. We know who they are. So we're going to take a walk through the town. And as we take a walk through the town, I'd like to point out uh, the background that we're walking past, which is currently these green covered hills with loads of trees. So there's not too much urban development going on in our town at the moment. And that might change as we go on. Now we're in the second level of the game. And the second level of the game is the level in which we're going to explore some of the choices that we can make as the Sindaco. So as the mayor of a town, our job isn't just to walk around talking to people and drinking coffee. We also need to make some decisions on the town itself. And we get the opportunity in this level to build two buildings. And these two buildings will add to our infrastructure, um, but in two very different ways. So we need to consider our choices carefully. The first person we're going to talk to who's going to offer us to build a certain building is Don Lothario. And remember, Don Lothario is the head of a mafia family, so his interests are largely about maintaining his own power and his own money in the town. And what he's going to offer us today as we go through this particular conversation, he's going to offer us to build a harbor, and he says he's going to pay for it. Um, the harbor for him would probably be really helpful because it brings in trade, uh, it brings in tourists, um, but most importantly, a lot of mafia families in the south of Italy currently make their money through the drug trade. So a harbor is something that could really bring him a lot of money. But because we're the mayor of the town and not the spokesperson for the mafia, we can't decide right now what is the best solution. So we're going to tell him that we're going to consider this um, and come back to him later, because we also need to talk to Maria Rosaria, um, our second character, and find out what she wants. She also has uh, an idea for how to develop the town, and so we should hear them both out. So right now, we're going to go walk to Maria Rosaria, who's in front of the church, and we're going to have a chat with her. Maria Rosaria is going to offer us in this conversation to build a hospital. Um, again, a hospital is one of the buildings that in the south of Italy, for example, and in many small communities all over the world, they don't really have the infrastructure to support healthcare in the same way that we do in major cities. Um, these kind of places have very little healthcare, if any at all. So building a hospital would probably be really beneficial for our town itself. So again, uh, we're going to have a chat with her. She's going to say to us, it would be a really great idea to build a hospital. Um, but the problem with that is the place that she wants to build the hospital and the place that Don Lothario wants to build the harbor are in the same plot of land, meaning that we can only choose one or the other. And that's going to have consequences on how our characters react to us later on. If we choose Don Lothario's uh, harbor, Maria Rosario is going to be upset with us and vice versa. If we choose Maria Rosario's hospital, then Don Lothario is going to be upset with us. So we're going to have to manage the expectations of these two people to progress in the game. So now we're going to walk back to the municipio, which again is the place that we get to make our decisions. It's our sort of hub where our sindaco gets to uh, change things in the town. And in this case, in this particular storyline I've prepared for you today, we're going to click on hospital. And so we're actually going to build a hospital in our town. And let's see what the consequences of this are. We're awoken one night to some strange noises. Oh no. <laughs> so a firebomb under my car, I'll deal with this tomorrow. So um, what's happened now is that because we've chosen Maria Rosario's agenda to build a hospital, uh, we've been threatened, uh, our lives have been threatened by some shadowy forces in the night. But let's talk to our characters the next day. Thankfully, we're still alive, if a bit shaken and scared. And let's have a chat with our characters and see who they think might have caused uh, this uh, act of terrorism. So now we're going to talk to Maria Rosaria, and Maria Rosaria is pointing her finger at the Mafia uh, and Don Lothario. So she's probably right, but let's go talk to Don Lothario uh, just to see what he has to say about the whole situation uh, with the car bombing. So here's Don Lothario, and he's going to, uh, we're going to have a chat with him uh, and see if he rats himself out, if he uh, has any idea of who maybe blew up our car last night and who would possibly threaten our wonderful Sindaco. With an attitude like that, perhaps it is clear why there are men out here that wish you harm. So through this kind of thinly veiled conversation, we can kind of tell that it was, in fact, Don Lothario and the Mafia buddies that blew up our car last night. And this is a problem, because the Mafia are very powerful. Um, and if they're threatening our lives, then it means that we need to deal with this problem quickly. So in fact, what we're going to go do now is we're going to go talk to Cristobaldo, and Cristobaldo is going to have some ideas of how to deal with the consequences of our actions. 
I wanted to deal with, uh, I wanted to talk about this kind of multi-stage branching storyline where consequences roll over and become further situations that you have to deal with, to kind of show how in these kind of communities, um, our actions, because people take them very personally, can snowball into these larger problems that become out of our control. So in this case, the Cristobaldo is going to offer us, uh, is going to say to us, maybe the best option is either to invest into the police heavily and hopefully get rid of the mafia once and for all, or possibly anger them further. Or uh, his second idea is to invest heavily into tourism in the town. Investing into tourism in the town will put money into Don Lothario's pockets and hopefully keep him off our backs. So we have two options to choose, both with incredibly different uh, results. And in this case, in this storyline, um, we're actually going to go and invest into tourism. So we're going to go to the municipio and we're going to click on tourism. And that brings us to the last level of the game and the conclusion to this storyline today. And as you might be able to see, our town has changed a lot since we first started in our first level. Those hills in the background covered in trees are totally gone and have been replaced with a lot of urban development. There's a lot more people in the town, a lot more trash and uh, noise pollution and light pollution. And I really wanted to exaggerate the effects of mass tourism on a town like this because I wanted to bring forward how in small communities, especially coastal communities um, that are very beautiful and very picturesque, they just unfortunately don't have the kind of infrastructure to support the extreme number of people coming to visit. And that can lead to some really negative consequences on the landscape and the town itself. But there is one person in our town who's very pleased with our decisions today, and that's Don Lothario. As we remember, Don Lothario, being the head of the Mafia family, is making a boatload of money from us investing into tourism. Um, because the thing is, with, the, with organized crime, they make also a lot of money within communities by investing in the service industry, by owning bars, restaurants, hotels, etc., etc. But the problem with this, as we can tell from this conversation, is that by appeasing Don Lothario, by investing money into tourism and making sure that he makes a lot of money out of this situation. We've actually handed over a lot of our authority and power as the mayor over to the Mafia. While this storyline that I've created ends here today, um, I wanted to include this in the writing to also kind of show how these consequences snowball and snowball into each other and ultimately end up in a situation where our player character who is supposed to have the authority over the town ends up losing it because of the decisions that we make throughout the game. So now we've had a chat to Don Lothario. We're going to go talk to Maria Rosaria and see what she has to say. Um, again, remember, Maria Rosaria is a woman of the people, so to speak, and so her concern is primarily with the community. And so this investment into tourism has probably not made her very happy, and she's going to tell us why. So here she is now, and we're going to have a chat with her and see what she has to say. Sindaco, fancy seeing you here. So, Maria is really not best pleased with us. Um, she says, I cannot understand why out of all the actions you could have taken, Don Lothario planted a car bomb to threaten you into doing exactly what he wanted. So, again, she's pointing out what, what I have just said again, is that we've ended up giving a lot of power to the Mafia, and that's going to have consequences on our town going forwards. The other thing she says is our people still need to go to school and get their medicine. Now this is important because in small towns like this, when investment is made into the service industry, the money ultimately has to come from somewhere. And it tends to come from the infrastructure of the place itself, such as schools, hospitals, and other vital necessary needs for the people to survive happily in the town. So, as we can see, our decisions that we've made uh, throughout this storyline haven't had the best effects on our town and our relationships and our community. But in the case of this game, Sindaco, you're not really meant to win. While this game is a simplification of local politics in that world, the consequences of our actions still highlight the problem facing communities like this today. How are people supposed to maintain an economy and preserve the culture and the environment with no infrastructure and no support from governments? It makes it an incredibly diff difficult experience that I wanted to bring the audience into to kind of see it from the other side of the equation. Because these kind of places tend to be holiday towns for us, but in reality there are places where people do live the whole of their lives there, and I wanted to bring that out in this game. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my game today. If you want to check out my game, you can play it on my website or uh, check out the rest of my work on the contact details on the screen. Thank you so much.
Is this? Is this thing on? Yeah. Big audience, amazing. <laughs> uh, let's see. I wrote an email about space, queer space, and heteronormativity. Listen, I can't help you. I have a date with Miss Green. I need to prepare the cleanup bag. Do you know anyone? Dad, did you do this? Kill him, blowing up my precious old pops, are we? Have you lost your manners along with your drilling rights, Shelly? When I close my eyes, I'm, I'm there again. This weird, crazy, but amazing street where everything goes. We were crying, we were laughing, we were dancing in the street. And Beautiful space isn't there anymore. So close your eyes, count to ten, and when you reach ten, come and find me.
Make it drop, that's some wet ass pussy. Now get a bucket and a mop, that's some wet ass pussy. I'm talking wop, 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 that's some wet ass pussy. Macaroni in a pot, that's some wet ass pussy, huh? Walking alone at night is honestly something that I've been doing for years. And it'd be like, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And I would just, like, you know, leave and I would just walk about until, like, okay, I'm done. It's not like, who finds me? It's like, there is a it just freaks me out, so I just deserve
What will have vanished into the black hole is not only the physical aspects of the city, buildings, trees, old industry, new industry, but also those histories and informations tangled into what makes up the city of gold. I do not mean here to imply the city of Johannesburg is a dead star. Her heart still beats, although her foundations are now empty. After we pulled her insides out and laid them on the surface to color the sunsets and sunrises with dust, we planted trees along her avenues, we hid the mine dumps away from our eyes. Now we dig at the insides on the outside again, trying to pull out what little is left. So do not think that I, as the prehistorian, believe the city of Johannesburg is a, de is a dead city but I equate her to that of a dead, dying star. I simply mean to say the city of Johannesburg will and has already been swallowed by a black hole. As the only prehistorian to exist in time, I concern myself with that which has not happened yet and phenomena that which exist across time, not that which has already happened, but that which will occur. I study the future as if it has already happened, history waiting to happen. Although I study the future like one might study history, it remains for the great part volatile. We only know something will happen, however not when or how this will affect us. And here I look to Johannesburg. Through Johannesburg, I also ask you to think of potentials for your own city. To quote Stephen Hawking, if the predictability of the universe breaks down with black holes, it could break down in other situations. Even worse, if information is lost, we can't be sure of our past history either. The history books on our memories could just be illusions. It is the past that tells us who we are. Without it, we lose our identity. If science and study are to understand that here we no longer speak about the truth of the universe through physics, but what might happen when a city becomes an illusion? Contradicting all we understand about our identities, of our information, building our histories, were to potentially and only exist in the memories of human capital flight. Those who have come, those who have left, those who will arrive existing as part of a large illusion in time and space demanding for predictability and empirical measure, but thrust into the hands of those who were instructed to strip the ground of her rivers of gold. We are left with nothing but the question of why. Why what? We are in an age of seeing as believing. What we see helps us to confirm our illusions of the passing of time, helps us to predict our futures. We see into the ground and the city unfolds into the present. But what happens when what we see beneath us is no longer there? The tunnels and tunnels and tunnels of deep-level gold mining has stripped the rock to build a city-wide identity, has disappeared and will disappear, not once again, but in the same breath between present and future. The city before the gold will also be gone. The unforgiving but strategically placed geographies allowing not only the English and the fur trekkers to use the hills for violence, but the Iron Age forges of the Basutus will quietly slip away too. What forges of history are to be rethought if it were already known they would become an illusion? Our relationship as those objectively observing the state of the city to be pulled under, places that uphold the strong constitution built with the bricks of oppression to protect those today and tomorrow. Each citizen of the place called Egoli will become part of the grains of sand dripping over the event horizon of this black hole. While the future of one place gets swallowed up into the earth, a question of histories and memories hangs in the air above this black space. Whole entire promises of freedom, change, development, having only just become grown-up thoughts, however already rotting, will be swept into the pull of the great high-felt event. Where are the rainbow-colored promises now? Johannesburg, a home for many seeking futures, seeking change, seeking hope, not only South Africans, but many who fall into a diasporic life within the city. When I see the name of that place, I see my name written on the page. Could I also throw myself into the gaping, swallowing, sucking, all-devouring space? What happens if I stood on her edge and screamed into the dark? Not even my voice would escape her hungry darkness.
Um, like everyone here today, I've spent a lot of time deliberating on what to tell you all. I went all the way back to where my entire interest in what would become my thesis and the project. Um, this was The Data Thief in The Last Angel of History, a documentary made by John Comfra, tracing Afrofuturist sound through time. I found urgency in The Data Thief's journey into the past and the imaginations from the future of what the present and the past will look like from there. With this in my mind, I look to be able to critique how South Africans and the citizens of Johannesburg are living our presence and what makes up the essence of our current existence. For this, I used science fictional narratives by South African authors about South Africa, and I called them South African futurisms. Now I'm asking you to join me on the edge of the city, or likely I'm asking you to join me from the tip of the city, in an apartment in what used to be the tallest residential building in the Southern Hemisphere. It's called Ponte Tower. In my previous presentation, I've asked you to join me from the top of a place called the Melville Copies, looking towards the city. And for today, we're going to stand within it, attempting to give you all glimpses of the place that I was born and raised in and where I imagine my own futures unrolling within. I found something that spreads deep into my subconscious, a place of expectation, but also a need for hope and a need to be able to imagine a potential future. Here, through science fictional metaphors and notions of futurity, I imagined a dystopia where nothing would be left but the grains of what I call memory sand. Notions of futurity encourage us to interrupt the quantitative notion of time. It intersects those predicted capitalist futures. This is ever so relevant when it comes to the state capture of South Africa, which I've heard recently we've had some arrests for, uh, where the systemic political corruption of the government in favor of private interests has so skewed the possible futures for those living in the city and in South Africa itself. In my thesis, as in my project, through reading and through imagination, I found uncomfortable critiques. And in part, I think it's important that we take responsibility for the critiques we make and the imaginations we decide to put out into the world. The prehistorian, the character I developed for myself, does not take interest in the phenomena of black holes and the unlikely event that it'll happen on Earth, but rather becomes entangled in the aspects of something that will be lost and their abilities to get lost if we no longer have them. The dystopia of South Africa, the state of her cities, the chronic skills brain drain, the constant violence of xenophobic and Afrophobic attacks, state capture, the complex waves of nationwide traumas threaten the future of South Africa and her cities, threaten them to a state of almost as good as swallowed by a black hole. I found a position where I thought I could be distant from these potential futures I imagined. Um, I found I needed, like in the last angel of history, that I needed to create a character for myself to look at these futures. So distance allowed me to critique my own attachment to the city. But also the opposite occurred. I discovered discomfort in the intentions of this character that I actually made. Um, so he made me more, this character made me more attached. So character, critique, distance, mourning, attachment, and then we start again. And before we end today, I would like to come to you with three quotes that I found particularly meaningful. The future in science fiction is a metaphor, um, as said in the introduction to The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin. And Samuel R. Delaney, when he's speaking about his role as a science fiction author in The Last Angel of History, science fiction doesn't try to predict the future, but rather offers a significant distortion of the present. And finally, the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion, said by Donna Haraway in the Cyborg Manifesto. Metaphors that help us to analyze the complex social realities which exist in the present, while disguised as predictions for the future. I believe the prehistorian existed within me before I arrived at these quotes or the project itself. I did not mean for my presentation while I was doing this to become an emotional outpouring for distress, um, about the distress for the future of a country whose present is so hopeless. As each person asks me, uh, where's next? All I can say is home, Johannesburg. For many, this looks like a shot in the foot. But for some, it is a step in the direction that could avoid a black hole opening up and swallowing an entire city. And to close off, I invite you to also become part of my metaphor and to be specific when you question your own cities and address future potentials for the cities you will live in, in the future and today. And so I ask you to imagine wisely. Thank you.
Um, and like everyone, I'm here all week. Um, and there's a little book that I have over there if you want to go look at it. Very skewed imagination of what Johannesburg should have looked like in the past. Um, yes, thank you. When I close my eyes, I'm, I'm there again. This weird, crazy, but amazing street where everything goes. We were crying, we were laughing, we were dancing in the street. And This 
beautiful space isn't there anymore. So close your eyes.不知道从什么时候开始，在每一个东西上面都有一个日子。系，我住喺呢度咯，即系橙色嗰个房。系，我住喺呢度，即系已经填到唔适应咯，吓填咗出嚟个青衣。喺度冇人去。呢度，咦？Once upon a time, there was a wolf living alone in a cave in the Black Forest. He was born a bit differently from the other wolves of his pack, so they mocked him every time they were frolicking in the clearing of the woods. Look at Looney. See how his underdeveloped chin makes his jaw weak and his bite crooked. He'll never be a strong wolf. He'll only be a burden to us. Not being able to hunt like we do, how could any she wolf ever want to be with him? <laughs> the odd wolf felt sad and lonely. He started to believe in his heart what his brothers had told him. On a cold winter's day, he decided to leave his pack to live in a place where they could no longer hurt him. For years, the wolf lived in that cave. Until one day, he spotted a human girl walking in the entrance of his hollow. He hid away in the dark, not wanting to be seen. The girl started picking the flowers in front of his cave, the flowers that he had tended to all these years he had lived there all alone. At first, the wolf went mad, but then he saw how the girl sniffed at the flowers and gave a smile unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Feeling his fear slipping away, he quietly emerged from his black hole. Uh, do you like them? The wolf asked. 
The girl looked shocked and scared for a moment, but then answered, Oh, yes, and they smell even better than they look. Oh no, are they your flowers? Yes, I've taken care of them, but you can keep them. You can even come back next spring if you want more. The girl smiled politely, but also looked a bit wary and said, uh, That's very kind of you. We'll see if I remember how to find this place by then. Goodbye! The girl left swiftly with an uttermost hurry in her step. The wolf felt disappointed. It had been so long since he'd felt the joy of company. And she'd been so beautiful too. Seeing her loving his flowers and giving him some hope that for the first time someone might actually start to love him. Feeling this new kind of excitement in his chest, he decided he'd follow her, her scent leaving a trail of where he should go. He followed this path to another corner, then the next, until her scent entered a little cabin under some maple trees. He ducked next to an open window and heard a raspy old voice. Oh, what beautiful flowers! Where did you find them? You could not have possibly found such delicate flowers in these woods. No, Grandma. I've grown them in my own garden for you. I've looked after them for months. They are beautiful, aren't they? Oh, yes, they are. Especially the red ones. I love dearly. Oh, that reminds me. I had knitted a red little cap for you as a present. Now I will always remember your beautiful red flowers whenever I see you wearing that cap. Big fat tears had started to roll over the wolf's furry cheeks. With shoulders drooped down, he walked back to his cave. He hated her. He had been kind to her, giving her his flowers, which he had worked so hard for to become that beautiful. She was evil. She simply did not see how good he was. She probably saw my weak jaw and my crooked bite. That's why she looked so shocked when she saw me. That's why she hurried away. If I had been a strong wolf, she would have stayed with me. Together we would have enjoyed our flower meadow. She is disgusting. Probably learned that behavior from that grandma. I reckon all the women in that village of hers are like her. And why wouldn't they be? My brothers already said I'd never find a mate. Everyone is against me. And why? I am a kind wolf. I'm just not that pretty. It's so unfair. If I can't be happy, then they also shouldn't be. The next day, the wolf awaited the girl on the path towards grandma's cabin. He saw her red cap emerging from behind the horizon. His heart started beating faster. What the ending is, is up to you, dear listener. What would the wolf do? Like in the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, is he a cold-blooded killer? Would he eat grandma and take advantage of Little Red Riding Hood? Or would he start a conversation with her? and discover her perspective of the story. What other possible outcomes can you come up with? And what would you do if you were the wolf? <laughs> this story is part of my graduation project, uh, Who are the Villains? It's a two-faced fairy tale book with on the one side a reinterpretation of Little Red Riding Hood through the eyes of an incel and on the other side through the eyes of feminism. INCEL stands for Involuntary Celibate and they are an online community of mostly heterosexual men who have communally created an identity around their lack of intimate and sexual relationships. As with most online communities, they've created their own very specific lexicon and their very specific idea of how the world works. What is so scary about this new development is that they blame women and feminism for their own unhappiness. 
so bad even that there have been terrorist attacks over the last 10 years proclaimed specifically in the name of incels uh, and they were in the US, UK and in Canada. Uh, as with most polarization, the increase of fear for the other side of the spectrum condones violence. So we need to get rid of this fear and we need to get rid of this faceless enemy shrouded behind the clouds. As traditional fairy tales show us, any character can do good or bad at any point of the story. It doesn't matter if it's the hero or the villain. So there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of complexity. Uh, there's a backstory uh, for their complex psychology. Uh, so this book tries to provide the reader with more understanding of the human being behind the ideology through the power of the fairy tale. And then I want to ask you this question uh, one final time. Who are the villains? Are there any? Thank you for listening. I'm going to take off my mic and then I'll be back. If anyone is curious, you can sit in the chair and read the book for yourself. And if anyone has questions, I'll be back in uh, 30 seconds. Thank you.
This is a kindergarten northwest of Kiev, Ukraine, which was destroyed at the beginning of the Russian invasion in spring 2022. The space was recorded by Yaro, a Ukrainian photographer, who used an app on his phone to 3D scan the environment. The software developer Polycam has offered its app for free in Ukraine, mainly so that people can digitally capture their national identity in form of cultural objects and places before they get destroyed. The 3D scanning process converts single images into a visual meta-image. This technique is called photogrammetry and in the context of warfare has already been used 100 years ago at the beginning of the 20th century. During World War I, the German Wehrmacht was already stitching together aerial photographs of surveillance flights into so-called autophotos to get a spatial overview of enemy positions. During the Second World War, it was mainly the Allies who sent reconnaissance planes over the attack zones directly after the mass bombings of German cities in order to evaluate the damage. Even today, these autophotos help Germany to locate and defuse unexploded bombs from the Second World War that are still in the ground of German cities. Many of the individual images overlap and capture the same section from two different perspectives. With a stereoscope, it is possible to analyze the images in 3D. Modern, computer-based photogrammetry relies on more than two images of the same object to create a three-dimensional model. Especially for larger areas of land and objects such as buildings, drones are used for this purpose. The mass of drone footage coming out of Ukraine exceeds that from other war zones. The proliferation of commercial drones has led to the increasing use of imagery taken by both professionals and amateurs to show the scale of destruction in areas that have been under attack. By being published on various video and news platforms, the clips spread almost in real time and are thus available to people all over the world shortly after the footage has been recorded. Visually, the recordings are similar. Slow and constant filming of a building or a landscape from different angles. If a video shows an object from many different angles, a digital model of it can be created with the help of photogrammetry software. Since February, more and more of these models that use public videos as a basis have been uploaded to different 3D platforms. Most of them are destroyed objects, vehicles, buildings or landscapes. Everyone with a computer and free photogrammetry software can participate in rendering available videos into three-dimensional environments, turning digital space-making into a civic-led practice of preservation and creation. Unlike normal photos or videos, spatial records do not tie the viewer's perspective to that of the person who captured a scene with a camera. Instead, they allow for free navigation. This also reduces the disconnection between viewer and object inherent in two-dimensional images. In a journalistic context, that opens up new ways of narrating information. Some news platforms have already experimented with photogrammetry, creating settings that users can actively explore. It is a challenge to guide the reader experience, as the flow of information is not inherently linear. But it's also an opportunity to think about new ways that allow readers to have more influence on how they consume information mm. and what that might oh, mean now it for works. combining it with traditional it news forms. Okay, cats. Cats. 
Yes, <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah. Box. Yes, there it is. Box. With the help of geo platforms like OpenStreetMap, Google Earth, or Bing Maps, the records can be spatially embedded and contextualized. In the process, the direct location of a place or scene is coupled with real coordinates, connecting digital point clouds to the physical world. <laughs> this allows for a better yeah, I, I guess. overview and reduces the obstruction <laughs> that comes from being removed. It's good from that I didn't say context. anything like dog garbage <laughs> shit <laughs> cat ass. It has more chances to happen. Yeah. In this hangar, the largest aircraft in the world, the AN-225, was destroyed by heavy fire. The quality of the model is so good that viewers can immerse themselves in the site as if they were there. For people who have been at the place, the model can be a helpful support to go back to the space of the event and recall it in as much detail as possible. It is also possible to analyze whether a statement could have taken place as claimed. For instance, whether a person had a clear field of fire at a particular spot. Of course, a 3D model should never be used as the sole evidence to support a statement, and even less so if the author is not a professional, trustworthy source. But in making a scenario tangible, it can be an important building block for a better understanding of past events especially for people who have not been there. In open source investigation, 3D models have been helping for several years to spatially analyze events and make them comprehensible. Often these models were created from scratch on the computer using architecture or 3D building software without incorporating photogrammetry into the process, which makes them less accurate and not suitable for an immersive experience. This makes open source photogrammetric models so exceptional. Almost anyone can participate in capturing a space of an event as a digital replica, enabling a sense of immersion that surpasses other forms of imaging. The immersive quality of spatial photographs can also be beneficial for individuals who have had a traumatic experience in a particular space, allowing them to travel back in time. Under professional guidance, they can address the trauma and reprocess it in a safe setting. Scientists in West Holland are researching on using semi-immersive environments in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, so-called 3MDR therapy. Patients are confronted with events of the past, but retain power over how far they want to approach the trauma through a virtual environment. According to these experts, it would be very helpful if patients had the possibility to take a different perspective in order to perceive what happened from another point of view and to be able to re-evaluate the scenario. The environment can be animated, objects erased or added. Personal photographs, for instance, are valuable in creating a stronger emotional connection to the scenario. Other external stimuli help to focus the patient's attention on something different at the right moment, supporting the process of reflection. For more information, visit spatialarchiveofwarfare.com.
Gefallen. starting very soon. Please take a seat. Okay. Hello, everybody. I have the pleasure and honor to introduce our last panel from the arena, which is the cat in the black box. And I have a bunch of beautiful people sitting here that are experts in demystifying this beautiful black box that you see here on the stage. And they will talk about technology, about cats, about memes and how there is this urgent need to demystify the internet and technology and what is actually inside this cat box. So sitting here today is Jan Christian Schulz, Teresa Fernandez Feo, Ron Walkery, Marie Redai, Rebecca Jochem, and Lukas Völb. And I hope you all will enjoy the session with these beautiful people. Give it up for them, please. <laughs> It's now, uh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so thank you, Tony, and hello, everyone. I am Teresa Fernandez Pello, um, a graduate from Contextual Design, and I'm going to be the first one today trying to unravel this uh, metaphor of um, the cat, the black box uh, we have brought. 
Um, so uh, through my research uh, project, I have uh, explored the connections between technological development and spiritual development in our society, uh, which we tend to, to think of like separated processes, but that I see as um, interconnected and actually codependent. And uh, more specifically, I'm um, uh, interested in the aesthetics that mediate this understanding. Um, so, um, yeah, one of the first questions that I made myself uh, when starting the project was uh, precisely um, um, why um, contemporary uh, everyday life technologies such as the mobile phone or the computer uh, take these uh, black box uh, shapes. So they are usually uh, these hard and square and opaque boxes. And what does this say of our understanding of technology, uh, but also of um, a deeper understanding of uh, more existential notions or deeper relationships. Um, um, so, uh, for example, I think um, the black box aesthetics separate these technologies from, um, from us in a very aesthetic visual way, but also from any biological entity. Uh, it separates uh, the artificial and the natural or notions uh, such as the human and non-human. Um, uh, so yes, I, um, I also think it's interesting that the black box represents somehow a mystery. Uh, and uh, yeah, like a, a black box usually hides from our perception something and uh, takes it out from our reach. And uh, I wonder why this mystification of technology. And uh, I wonder if we are perhaps uh, giving certain uh, authority uh, to the way uh, technological knowledge takes shape today. So, um, uh, yeah, like, uh, um, maybe we, we, we see these technologies as untouchable or unreachable. And I think that's the main question I can relate from my uh, project uh, to this topic today. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, thank you, Teresa, for your introduction. Um, I think my role... I, my design role as designer in my process about the black box was, I think, wondering a little bit how we can demystify the black box. And I think one of the things I realized, like here being here with my project and showing it to people, is that it's not something that everyone wants to do, to kind of take this step of um, going, like opening it up. Because I think it's very convenient and comfortable to kind of keep this whole technology abstracted behind that like layer that we cannot understand or comprehend and think, oh, it's just too complex for us. Because I think opening that up also kind of forces us to face, you know, the consequences and like maybe the things that we don't want to see and the things that are problematic with that. So, but once we accept to kind of look it up, I think the role as designer is, is to kind of look at it and kind of break it down in like smaller steps so that we can kind of comprehend it. So in computer science, like the idea of the black box is just kind of um, there's an input and there's an output. So if I take this black box and I shake it, <laughs> there is an output. And it kind of tells me maybe there's a cat in there. So that would demonstrate kind of what I was doing during my process was really just this okay, input, output. And I think when I talk about like mediation, I think as a designer, we have to kind of think of how to shift the relationship to that black box for the audience. And I think there's a few things to do in that sense. I think the first thing is like looking at scale, because I think nowadays technology is either very small, like it's super tiny phone antenna, for example, or like microchip, or a very, very big data center, or, you know, the submarine cables that are carrying information under the ocean, you know? And all of this feels completely intangible because it's not to our scale. So we're kind of working in like the scale of, you know, the body, the scale of like engaging, something we can engage with. So that was one point. And I think the other thing is just to kind of look at like creating tangible outcomes. So translate it in like, you know, using uh, our senses. And I think Jan can say something a little bit more about how we can um, create of tangible outcomes with our humans that are like and using the black box as an extension of ourselves and like something we can kind of comprehend better. Yeah, thank you, Marie. Um, exactly, I was working a little bit about um, how is the black box in between 
us, like in between our human body and our environment. Because um, somehow you can basically everything that surrounds us is, are certain forms of data that our body constantly needs to process. And how, how is the body processing this data? Usually through our senses, everything we see visually, everything we hear um, are certain forms of, of data that are being, um, how can you say, uh, processed and they allow us to perceive our environment, to react to this kind of data and um, also to, to interact with our environment. So you can see it on the screen, like <clears throat> basically our whole sensorium is is mediating what happening, what's happening around us and how we are responding to it. So the interesting thing I think for me is um, that since ever humans are creating something, they are extending their bodily capacities through design, through technology. So since ever we also created tools, uh, tools like you can see on the screen, that allowed us um, through technology to, to sense our environment, to extend our senses to that extent that our bodily capacities are being, I don't know, um, spread out over the whole planet, even if you think about sensors and monitoring stations that are constantly getting the data from the environment, informing us about um, the weather that is going to be tomorrow, certain changes in the, in the environment, and then it's particularly fascinating that if you look at sensors and, and monitoring stations, it's something that for many people might appear as a black box because it's hard to understand how they work. But then actually they share a very close kinship to our organic senses. If you look at cam how cameras work, the way they see basically and transmit the information to us is uh, very close to the eyes of the humans. And then if you think about monitoring stations that are put in swamps, in oceans, shot into the space, they all transmit, um, they transmit our, how can you say, uh, they transmit data through technology to our body that allows us to perceive environmental changes. They are basically mediating an experience that is happening on one side of the planet or overall on this planet. And as you can see, this hyperspectral imagery, for example, um, that is taken by uh, the eyes from the space, um, they use different light spectra to, to inform us about intoxicated water bodies, for example, or about the ripeness of plants. And all this knowledge that we gain through our extended senses, through technology, also activates some um, intervention in this place so we, we can react to it. And then slowly handing over to Rebecca. Um, also, if we come back to the cat and the black box, then <clears throat> there's uh, the idea of an x-ray, for example, that uses light to extend our eyes. And it, this data that, that is mediated through the x-ray exercises a certain form of um, transformative power over our reality and extends and changes our perception of the cat. Yeah, thanks, Jan. I will take it from here, I guess. Um, yeah, I was really, I'm really fascinated by this uh, transformative power um, of kind of our data lenses. Because, I mean, if we use the cat as an example, um, it's yeah, it's a it's a different entity whether we look at it um, through the X-ray, uh, which is more this medical lens, uh, or if we have the actual kind of sensory feeling of. Uh, the cat on our lap, which is like a, a warm, fuzzy, vibrating um, being. Or if we look at um, kind of cats through social media, for example, where, I don't know, there are cats that have millions of followers. Uh, um, and it's like this huge internet phenomenon of cat memes uh, uh, floating around everywhere. Um, <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I find it really interesting how um, our technology and like black the black boxes we're talking about have a role in that because um, the way they're designed, what kind of data they're looking at, and how they're feeding it back, like representing this data back to us, changes the reality that's around us. Um, so we, as designers of these black boxes, also have to be aware about um, the power dynamics that are in between here. If we look at 
um, cats on Instagram, for example, uh, um, an adventure cat um, that has two million followers, that is in Airbnb commercials, um, that is the main source of income also for its owners, um, it has a very different life uh, because of dynamics that go on on this platform that it's famous on. So it's about generating traffic, uh, um, increasing screen time, uh, uh, creating interesting content all the time, um, which is interests that may not actually be in the cat's uh, um, um, main interest, uh, maybe. Um, or then if we look at um, um, someone who's, who has a business in pet health, for example, um, that's another very different um, view on cats. Uh, um, uh, someone who takes an x-ray sees the cat as a patient um, uh, and has also, there is also this power dynamic of how to interpret um, this medical data. And as designers, I think um, if we're aware of this and if we realize how, um, how we, the way we shape these black boxes also can support or also subvert these power dynamics, um, it can become really valuable to think about these things. And I think, Lucas, um, you're bringing a more kind of historical perspective on this, right? And you wanted to share some examples? Uh, yes, exactly. Um, thank you for this uh, nice introduction to my part. But uh, yeah, exactly. Um, what I want to talk about a bit is that, of course, um, the idea of the black box and the concept of the black box is something that in a tra has a tradition in uh, a way that, um, of course, like this idea of technology being something that we cannot fully understand, always is something that has been cultivated through design and by design um, in a way and uh, I want to start with a very historical um, yeah, example. I think maybe some of you might know it. It's uh, the Mechanical Turk. It's an, uh, it's an apparatus that was built in the, in the 18th century by a Hungarian inventor. And um, this machinery was basically built as an, as an artificial intelligent uh, object that would allow, that would basically uh, be autonomous in playing chess and defeating opponents um, and what then in the end came out is that it's actually a, a real human being hidden inside of this black box um, that was actually uh, responsible for the chess playing and it was all an idea to um, to obscure the uh, to obscure kind of that um, there is actually human labor involved and uh, we see that today this tradition is very much continued in a lot of other uh, ways for example you see here right now the visuals that um, there is uh, the cloud, for example, the very prominent uh, way how the idea of uh, technology, of data floating around, uh, around us in like thin air is mediated through the idea of a cloud. And, uh, but the truth is that these, this data is actually very much physically present in, uh, in, in, this, in server uh, farms, um, in, in, in uh, structures that are very like... Um, very much uh, using energy and power and resources to be, uh, to be uh, maintained. And this is a reality that is, for example, hidden and that is also, in a way, um, contrib contributing in the idea that, that technology has a certain power, has uh, this, this, uh, this uh, overpowering and um, almost uh, yeah, like a magnificent quality uh, that seamlessly just does what we want it to. Um, another example that you can see more on a visual, uh, visual layer is now how companies are basically also instrumentalizing our idea and of our, our imagination into something, generating it into something that uh, paints a very, um, yeah, a very, very seamless picture of technology, which is uh, the illustration styles that are being used by them and uh, that basically show us a world that is fun and, and uh, colorful and has no problems in them. Or uh, also here, like certain ideas from design, for example, that robots are a lot of times use similar ideas of how, um, yeah, Renaissance paintings uh, are designed, how statues are designed. This, uh, yeah, this uh, impeccable idea what design can do. And uh, I want to um, introduce or bring in our specialist here, Ron Wackery, by asking. Uh, should design maybe strive more for technology literacy 
And this transparency in that way is something that is desirable when we think about uh, tech, the functioning of technology in our society. Thank you. So first of all, it's amazing to be in this wonderfully choreographed event. <laughs> Absolutely. It's actually really quite an honor to be amongst you guys. I think you're doing really uh, amazing work, and these are the kind of questions we want to ask. And, and just by way of some background, so I, I think there was a, <coughs> a cover of a book that I recently wrote called Things We Could Design, which is more than human-centered design, which really for me, was wanting to theorize a, a practice, uh, an alternative, a practice of designing I call designing with, um, that is not only acknowledged, but inclusive of the more than human worlds. And by that, I mean everything, humans and is not human, and that inclusive of technology, inclusive of biological life and matter. Um, and, and the goal there is one of, um, you know, we think often thinking through the goals of what we do for design for me is cohabitation. How do we kind of cohabit the very more than human world that we are in? And this question about transparency is really interesting. The question about the black box, I mean, I think the simple one is I'm here to speak on behalf of the cat, which, <laughs> uh, but actually we don't even know what the cat is. So that's the, the, the good question here. But this interesting idea that we, what, what I kind of explore is this interdependency that we have with technologies, which, which is, and the more than human world, which is very deep. It's something that very much shapes us. I like to think that, that we are prosthetic creatures. The questions we ask of technology are actually maybe too many questions because we are so uh, interdependent with the very technologies that we make. But in that kind of worlding, it really does construct a, 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 a challenging, problematic, and ultimately highly political space, one in which you negotiate. So there's an interesting question about transparency with black boxes. So black boxes are really about obscuring much of these relations. In that sense, some, some simplifying, but also depoliticizing, uh, I think, that these relations and the need to negotiate around these relations. And I think that's one of the reasons why we might want to unpack it. But on the other hand, we want to be mindful of the fact that we can't make these things transparent. The things that are not us, technologies, cats, we can only understand to a degree. They withdraw from us. We are so, if we're in the world of contradictions where we're so interdependent with that more than human world, but yet we are not completely of the more than human world. Um, and I think working through those sets of relations, so I think what's really most important when you talk about opening these things up, chasing a cat, whether it's the grumpy cat meme or, 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 or the health industry of cat health industry, are these various relations. And then how do we as designers through our own practice kind of negotiate those relations, which is partly some of the politics. Um, and how do we open up those relations to, to negotiation for others? Thank you. Does someone take? Think you had another question? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I mean, for me, uh, through my research, I was of course like constantly um, confronted with the agendas that are behind the design of certain things. And um, what I see is like kind of the predominant ideas that shape the utilization of of technology are usually uh, motivated by earning money, for example, what all the platforms are doing is they basically harvest our intention spans by keeping us as long attained as possible. And for me, it's just like a, a moral question that I, as a designer, have for myself as a graphic designer that designs interfaces that looks into why things are made the way that are, they are made, is uh, should a designer have an agency uh, in like designing things differently in order to create something that is legible and gives a bit more information about what is happening to the users, to the consumers. Mm -hmm. Is that not a question of fairness and is that not a trajectory that technology in general should have in the future if we think about that it becomes more and more uh, in uh, a part of our social environments? Yeah, I, I think at, at absolute minimum, yes. I mean, at absolute minimum, it's a question of fairness as is if, you know, in, in engagement of transaction, what, what are fair transactions? But I think it's also a matter of fairness and justness in terms of the consequences of use, the consequences of use of technology. But I think that's the absolute minimum. Mm -hmm. And I know we're far from the absolute minimum. Um, I think as designers, we also have to not just rethink what we design, but how we design. And we have to think about the broader interdependencies, the political structures, that the collective structures by which you design. I mean, I think we've, we have constructed um, one based around, you know, of course, now in its Re repeat around information technology and digital technology before where other forms of technologies 
a ways of capitalizing quite literally. And these are the collective structures and we, corporations, design consultancies, whatever, that we assume that that's the, the, the structure by which we design. But I think more attention to actually rethinking what is the values by which you want to design and then therefore what are the structures that you need it's a lot harder, <laughs> and, and, and it's something that I would have to, and I, I mean, it's one thing to get up and say these things, but I learned when I wrote the book, I was trying to figure out, get ahead of myself, and I feel I have to engage in significantly more. So I think there's a kind of range, and I think we need, we need to map out the, those range, but then also when we map that out, is open it up to other alternatives. But, but yeah, I think we're far past the idea of a kind of, kind of just way of doing design, whether that's, the, that's a matter of climate or whether that's a matter of social justice, whether that's a matter of just plainly fair transactions. Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I feel like, I mean, we're also all sitting here because um, in our topics and in our graduation projects, this was a thing we had to face, especially at the beginning, to figure out, okay, what is our strategy? Like, how do we want to face these, uh, these questions in each of our projects? Um, I don't know, Tere, do you want to do you want to elaborate a bit on like how you started on that? Um, yes. So um, because my project was uh, dwelling precisely on this interconnectedness between spirituality and technology, I um, yeah, I mostly uh, touch the question from an aesthetic um, um, approach, uh, but because uh, I I felt. Um, yeah, like um, uh, to look into technologies uh, as uh, spiritual devices uh, was something that could um, break um, and um, at least uh, challenge uh, certain notions um, that, yeah, that I, I consider are uh, maybe um, inherited from um, all their uh, ways of understanding the world, all their epistemological um, um, yeah, um, states or uh, societies. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, for me, uh, it was hacking and looking these technologies look like that was already enough to engage in a different relationship that included the spiritual dimension. And um, yeah, I guess this is something that I reflect, but I also... Uh, would like to discuss maybe with you yeah. how, because I feel um, it is something really separated, like the arts school, the fine arts, classical fine arts, or even still we are considering fine arts, the sculpture, the mm -hmm. painting. And I see in the Design Academy graduation this year, everyone is using technology as a medium for expression and for aesthetics. Right. And I feel it shouldn't be that separated. I don't know what's your vision on, on They that. shouldn't be that separated, the which the technology So the, the the technological schools and the art schools. Oh yeah. I, I think they are like merging um, uh, more yeah. and more. Yeah, I I but I mean I think if we haven't figured out we're in a technological world <laughs> what others have, you know, the technicity yeah. that it's not something that it but then we've always been and I, I think that was really interesting about your work. Two things I found really interesting about your work was that one, you do kind of unpack the black box behind devices and you can see the instrumental logic at work for why these relations are put together and why these technologies are put together. And yes, they're driven toward a particular understanding of productivity, consumption, et cetera. And you offer another set of relations by which we might organize technologies in, in the really practical material sense of a device. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting. So I think that's really interesting because I think that's exactly the negotiation that should be happening when you open up black boxes, not just to make them transparent, but then those are the material arrangements and how, and designers are very much a part of that. How then can we rearrange, find alternatives? Um, the second thing is that, of course, spirituality, well, organized religion, let's put us there, um, has, has always had this really deep relationship to technology. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, cathedrals were the technologies of the day. And we talked about that. The degree of complexity was mind-blowing. The amount of labor yeah. that was required, the new techniques of construction. We could even talk about now, people are talking about psychotropics. That's another technology. And that's always been a kind of technology of spiritual, of spiritual belief. So I think that's kind of what I, I, I think we do a, ourselves a disservice. We blind ourselves to certain sets of practices when we don't give in, we don't, ex we don't try to wrestle with the multiplicity of views that you can have. You can have a technology which is arranged spiritually. You can have a technology that's arranged not spiritually. That there are these different ways in which you do that. And when one is dominant, it simply obscures. Um, and I think that part of that obscuring is if there is a world that exists without technology. And then that, 
that just gets in the way of, I think, what ends up happening are the real consequences of what we make. Like, we're not in control of what we do. We design things, we world, we make things. And if we make them with such a myopic or narrow view, they have these effects, and not that we should anticipate all the effects, but we don't even know what the things are that we make do. Mm-hmm. So I think that division and that kind of separation is, yeah, really problematic. Yeah. 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 But, and so I think just society is face for technology and spirituality. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I feel all of us, we are uh, kind of challenging it just by the fact of uh, making art projects, uh, um, yeah, like using as main uh, material, mm. technological connections. And I think there's already a, a message, an aesthetic message happening when you come to design academy graduation show and you see all that much technology involved that mm. perhaps uh, some years ago was not. Um, I don't know, for example... If, yeah, um, but I think there's also still nowadays like a wow effect with technology. Like I see it with like the audience we are here. Like they are so impressed and they don't really like, they like this kind of magic. And it's really like, I feel like sometimes demystify the black box also means like disenchanting it. And that's something that's something that's sometimes not so easy to... I mean, it, it can be done, but I think it's also finding ways of not like only showing a very like negative narrative. Because I think like a lot of like these processes of going from you know opening the black box in a more or less metaphorical way is often like oh my god, this is really really bad what's in there, you know, <laughs> you know, like oh labor, oh like pollution, you know, plastic, whatever, um, bias, all of this, and I think it's a uh, what I find, what I found quite hard is kind of finding ways of creating a new relation with the technology that we are kind of unpacking and thinking about how these kind of processes can be empowering and not only scary. And yeah, I think that's still, it's very important, but that's still really not always easy to, to navigate that kind of uh, equilibrium. And I think it's a, uh, Nowadays, we also have like a lot of tools available and I think very amazing communities of like makers and, you know, open source resources that we are using, which feels like it's not that complex to kind of make that step. But then I think then the question for us as designers is not so much opening the black box, but like finding ways of like mediating that opening and yeah, playfulness. And I think this is something we also you were using and we both like kind of you invite people to dance with the, with the data they have. And I think that's like something, yeah, kind of changed in the narr- yeah, or relationship we have, but still in process. For sure, for sure. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like you have a very hands-on way of doing that. Yeah. Uh, um, and you're also inviting people to play with these Wi-Fi waves in a very, invite everyone to see the project. Yeah. Um, uh, and I really like that. And I feel like... Um, what Tere and I maybe have more is, and, and I don't know, I think you relate to this as well, is like this conceptual idea of like, okay, if we think about it, if we talk it about it in a way where, um, yeah, we're opening these boxes. In my case, it's often through personifying technology and like making characters out of these these things. So we realize, okay, it's a two-way relationship. It's a conversation we're having somehow. It's like I'm influencing the technology and it's influencing me back and together we're kind of creating something new uh, um, and like a a kind of new um, mediated identity in my case because it's about personal data. Um, I find it really interesting to talk about it in that way. Mm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, like uh, for for me, I think what the observation that you just uh, uh, talked about was, is very interesting well, for uh, at least what I experience a lot uh, with my project, when people are coming and uh, watching at this uh, this interface that I created, this uh, this this painting basically is constantly morphing and representing who you are based on your based on your data that you produce on your uh, on, on platforms. Is that it is actually very like uh, people don't like that much being confronted with their interaction, with their footprint, with the 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 consequences that are being that are caused by their behavior, um, and uh, it's very interesting because, of course, like 
we all think about the like fairness and we all think about we we would like to see more and we or it's like there's this huge debate about it but on the other hand then when we are confronted with it it's a very it's we don't like the experience actually actually so uh mm -hmm. yeah i don't know like where where's so how do we how can we bring that together like uh, like this 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 idea of fairness and transparency and but still like keeping up what technology is supposed to be which is efficient uh, efficiency and 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 uh, and like enriching our our sensory uh, experience or, or or the way how we think and all all these kind of aspects that we mediate through technology yeah i i mean it's daunting but i i i you know it's not necessarily like data in itself i mean i think it's a question of scale <laughs> and asymmetries i mean i think in the face of the kind of scale of data and effect. And I think also, particularly like in your project, I mean, you're talking about the asymmetry of really who gets to, to um, use that data as material for what purpose that you have no um, political um, effect, um, uh, you know, that you're, you're a part of. Sorry, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> the black box wants to speak. Yeah. I know, so good. It'll be okay. Um, so I, I think that that, um, yeah, it's no doubt. I think, I think it's a tough question, but I do think that then the question of, you know, I think we also misplace then in some ways that I don't think it's, again, what we necessarily, our relationship to technology, the necessity, the need to understand ourselves better through data, the need to share data, the need to understand maybe a certain amount of transparency of each other through data. But again, I, you know, I don't think it's a technolog technological question. It's a political question. It's a question of asymmetries. It's a question of unabashed scale. It's a question of who has to be accountable for that and who's going to regulate that. It's kind of messed up that you kind of open up a space like this school and many other schools where they say, be openly creative, because then that's an extractive process that they can open up. And people, others can open up and scale that creativity and those sets of explorations. And so I do think that there is that... Um, uh, you know, I like to, I have a concept in the in the book, and it's called um, biographies. And and I think it's this question about thinking about the overall kind of life force, the designer, and the things they make, and the non-human agencies that are at work. But how that inscribes itself into the world, and then how they things end. And it's often biographies end much long. I mean, they take much longer. They live much longer than we do. They go they go lifetimes, and they go generations. But sometimes I think as a designer or designers and those involved in the whole process and the assembly of design. We need to think about designing our endings, not just the beginnings. And I think it's a sense of beginnings, and then we feel we need to intervene in what existed. So there's a project here that's, that's showing, which is why a uh, PhD is working with me, Saul Beza. It's about facial recognition. And one can think in the black box and in the scale of facial recognition that this is something that is, that is daunting. But what happens when you open up that black box? And, and, and first of all, the, what the question of facial recognition is, it's not a big surprise that the elements of facial recognition, recognition result in racism. Uh, just because the question of data and the question of who programs it and the question of where that data comes from, that's challenging, that's a problem. The real problem is the fact that facial recognition systems are implemented in systems by police forces, by, you know, by corporations, by, by governments, knowing of, of that. But you can get into the black box, and that's what he did, and he opened it up to use facial recognition and through facial prosthetics, the design of facial prosthetics, to, like you say, not necessarily just open it up and critique, but open it up and explore alternatives once you're in. And the facial prosthetics allowed, through constructions of aesthetics, to create different identities recognized by the facial recognition systems. And so on the one hand, it's an intervention. On the other hand, it's just that's the material at work that he is working with and generating something else and allowing for some way to negotiate with this, it, what seems like, this system that you have no agency in, which is facial recognition. Um, so I, I, I do think it's, 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 it's all of those things at the same time, opening things up, but I do think we have to challenge questions of scale. We do think we have to question the politics of asymmetries and, and, and how we do that, that's a big question. But I think also I do come back to like the very structures that, that we engage in to do our design work. Those structures are actually designed to do all those things that maybe are really where the issues are, scale and asymmetries. I really like this idea of, of using the tools. I think it's like, or for me, it's always this xenofeminist uh, perspective of saying, okay, 
um, they're all there, they're all out there. And I like that in art schools now, or especially also in my course at Design Academy, it was all about like um, exploring with these tools and making them your own so yeah. you can use them for your own purposes. Like, um, And I think that's where uh, kind of designers dabbling in these fields of code or... Um, uh, electronics can be also really nice because there's no way there's no one telling you this is how it's right because yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean they're not yeah. there <laughs> so uh, you can kind of just uh, try and sometimes you make things that work in a completely different way but actually do things that you like uh, mm -hmm. compared to like the preset um, kind of finished products that yeah. you can mm -hmm. buy on the market um, but I was wondering, Jan, whether you also wanted to talk about how that was a challenge for you because you were mediating relationships with nature more, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Uh, so what I found particularly interesting was um, to think about the, or how do you say, like organicality of technology, how organic is actually, it is actually. Because... Um, when when you think about what technology actually is and who exercises technology, then it's maybe not even only humans exercising technology because <clears throat> there are also other species on that planet that use matter and assemble it together. They, they transform it into something, be it a bird's nest or a beaver's dam. So where's the difference between what other species are doing and what humans are doing? So... There are certain forms of technology. Um, maybe the one that humans are exercising at the moment becomes more complex because it's like an evolutionary process between technology design and the human that is constantly going on and where both of them, I don't know, transforming each other somehow. But then, um, huh, what did I want to say actually? What was my point? Um, <clears throat> I think you, like, the way I can relate really, what Rebecca just said in your project is also, like, how by, like, as a designer appropriating this technology and, you know, kind of using the new tools that are available that we can use ourselves without the help of technicians, you can kind of subvert the technology to use it in a different context and, like, you use it to connect with nature and creating a link that is not really existing. Yeah, exactly. I think, like, the way, um, I don't know, that I, for example, use te technology in my project was to to try to get, um, to form new re new relationships also to, <clears throat> to far distant places that um, through environmental monitoring stations in this sense, like sensors that are put somewhere, that they allow you to mediate an experience from one place to you wherever you are on this planet, just connected by the inf infrastructure of the internet or telecommunication systems. So um, especially these huge infrastructures is something that was building up over decades, constantly like put by humans into nature, allowing us to, to experience and perceive what is happening. And then also um, it's a question how it's mediating our relationships to other species. Maybe it allows us to... Um, to know how, how they relate and behave in the environment that we are all together in. So there's, it's hard to say that there's a separation process somehow of, um, of, of the artificial and the organic technology of humans and non-humans. So I think that was one of the most interesting findings that I had through, throughout my research process. So do you think uh, we as humans should start building more applications or more devices also for non-human entities? Good question. I mean, it's happening already. Like, um, if you think, um, I don't know, about uh, glacier blankets, artificial reefs, these are interventions, like technological interventions within ecosystems that are not necessarily made for humans, but also for, for non-humans, like when we're talking about artificial reefs. It's something that is put into place somewhere to help non-humans maybe to, to start flourish again. <clears throat> yeah, even though then it opens up other questions. Why do we need artificial reefs even? Because we started already <laughs> intervening before in these kind of ecosystems that were unbalancing them. So, yeah, I think technology is the way that is constantly mediating everything that we are doing, the interactions with our environment. So... I think that's maybe also something that brings us to a very fundamental question in the end uh, that 
basically drives the process of technological progression is kind of this idea that technology can solve everything in the end and that, I don't know, like even transcend the state that humans even are right now, that the human is just one step in an evolutionary process and that technology is the thing that will expand us over the universe or whatever. So I don't know, like what... Has anyone? Uh, we we cannot propose final or definitive solutions, but it's just in in the making stuff that we just keep on going <laughs> and developing technologically. But so, maybe there's no end. Yeah, and I think, but maybe, and I, I think in what you're saying, and also what Jan was saying about, I mean, the, the multi-species relations and technologies, and and maybe it's our obsession with the notion of technology, and that's a, a human construction. We talk about with this focus of technology, and perhaps even the idea that technology is a medium that it is separate. From us, and we think about what you mentioned. Maybe you know, yes. I mean, as I say, we're prosthetic creatures amongst amongst the continuum of prosthetic creatures, of which beavers, crows, you know, would be very much a part of that. But we might look at that technology and say it's somewhat less evolved. But that's because we focus on the object of technology, the dam. However, in a kind of ecological interdependent sense, there's incredible complexity there that we cannot do. We can't leverage those in, those interdependencies, and we can't leverage the relations. And we think about like now we're learning in biology the relations between fungi and plants and trees, and it's these multi-species relations. So, do we design for other species? No, we design in a multi-species world that we have to cohabit. But maybe we have a certain focus of complexity, which is like a tech story of technology, which is black box technology, which separates all the relationships. It actually removes the complexity, and you know, in the most cynical, it removes it for purely ideological grounds. Um, and 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 I think that's the virtue of opening it up. Is in fact, no, we're interconnected. So yes, it's spiritual. Yes, you know that there are. If you're in a swamp, you're in amongst the whole series of technologies and complex systems and complex scales, and 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 that have been that was cohabiting. They'd been evolving that for for some period of time. So in some way, it's someone. It's just like a shift of perspective. But I think it's um, either to say I do technological work or I don't do technological work. Or I obsess on technology. Where I think it's that notion of technology, which we haven't really named what exactly it is. It remains that, and I think in some sense that's probably for the better. Um, and 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 I think that's the point about our interdependencies. We actually are so. It, technology is shaped by us, and we have shaped it. There is no binarism there. Interesting. Very nice. Nice. Maybe this is the moment where we can ask the audience if anyone has questions that want to be heard on and answered as possible. <laughs> Someone has to say something here. Like someone's hungry. It, the cat is definitely hungry. Oh, there's a question there. Nika. Wait a second. That's a quite easy question, actually. Um, I'm curious where I could actually see your project here around. Yes. Well, maybe we can do a round. Uh, so uh, my project is basically the first thing that you see when you enter uh, through the main entrance. It's a huge portrait that sits in the middle of a circle of screens, and it's basically yeah, it's a, it's like I already said it before. It's a AI generated portrait and uh, mediates uh, my social media feeds and mirrors them back at me as a kind of a reflection surfaces. I'm also in the basement, <laughs> and I invite you all to come over because I personified all personal data into uh, this kind of fictional entity of the data double, and you can dance with it when you're uh, um, with me in the basement. So you're welcome to come. <laughs> It's very fun to dance. I've done it. Um, my project is in the first floor in the bachelor department's communication. So you have to yeah go up and then go a little bit. You have to look for it. It's a bit of a maze here, but uh, and then you can. It's an interactive um, installation where you can hear the Wi-Fi waves from your phone and kind of play with it like a theremin. So yeah, it's also uh, would love to see you there. Uh, my project is also in the basement, um, and it's right uh, after, uh, uh, like close to the entrance, and it's. Um, Kind of a neo altar techno, um, kind of in a shape of an altar, but um, full of um, electronic devices. Um, yeah, and I, I will be there uh, probably in this afternoon. 
Yeah, I'm uh, sharing the space in the basement as well with these people. Um, <laughs> so if you look for something that is inflated and swimming around there, it's going to be my project probably. Mm -hmm. So it's um, yeah, an object that allows you to, to enter different environments, especially the swamp at the moment. So there's a live transmission going on. <clears throat> if you want to listen to it, uh, feel free to come by, of course. But um, are also, there other questions? Also, Ron, where can we find your book? Yeah, exactly. Sure. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's at Mata Books, which it might be. And then, of course, you can you can get it online. Just avoid the one with the guy who wants to go out into space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you can get it there, too, if you wanted to. Uh, yeah. 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 It's by MIT Press, so they're pretty good at distributing it. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. So um, I don't know if to close, uh, we wanted, uh, I think that the, the final question that we wanted to, to ask it was about our agency no? as designers and uh, we wanted uh, to have your opinion on that, uh, maybe to, yeah, to close the debate. Uh, yeah, what, what is actually, uh, what can design uh, and design schools do? Um, yeah, oh, okay. Uh, but I do actually try to, I do actually <laughs> try to address it in the book and I try to break out two... I think I, I use one word, but it actually refers to two words. It's a book, so it's all about words. But anyway, the, the one word, it was generosity. Um, but it breaks down into two words, which is one, humility. So to understand that there are more than, there are other agential, agential actors when it comes to designing, including non-humans. They're very much a part of it. You have to have a degree of humility if you're going to design something in a swamp. There are others that are very much occupied and cohabited that space and you're designing with them. That's the idea of the designing with. The second part is that part, though, within that humility. So we don't have as much agency as we think. But I do have this notion of expansiveness, and that's actually being much more horizontal than vertical. That is to try to connect, try to create as many connection points as you possibly can, and to work with that relations between those connections, rather than I'm going to focus on designing the technology or I'm going to focus on X. It's the connections between them. So I do think that that, and then actually the last thing I'll add, and I think this is really one of the tragedies of where we've gotten to with design, with the kind of individual empowerment of everybody's individual creativity, is that in order to design the way we need to, we, what we need to do, it's a collective effort. So I do think that agency is formed as a distributive one, and thus finding the collective structures by which we design. And that's how I think we'll kind of enact a degree of, of ability and empowerment um, and that can scale in any number of ways, and that can be situated, and that goes to a lot of feminist epistemologies about situated knowledge, embodied knowledge, and really act in that way. Um, and and if you can, if that happens collectively, in multiplicity, pluriversal ways, all of these, then I think that then then yes, that's how we can uh, kind of engage the agency of being a human designer. Mm. Yeah, that help? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Do we actually want to uh, reveal our little co <laughs> co uh, moderator here? Maybe by end? saying cat. Cat. Do you see it? Oh, yeah, it worked. <laughs> 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 Box. No, it doesn't, doesn't work anymore. But it did it's already a great it's job. So we said apparently 132 times black box in the last hour and 144 times technology. So this is already a lot of data we can work with if we uh, understand what we are actually talking yeah. about here the last yes. minutes. To understand the cat in the box? Uh, no. Box? It did it. Box it once. Well, okay. Yeah. It was our co-moderator, the AI listening in and trying to understand the keywords um, that we're saying that trigger certain things. And I'm going to try to say cat one more time. No. Cat? No, I didn't cat. Box? Wow. Well, <laughs> but with that. It's shaping what you're saying. More than it's, it's hearing thing. what you're saying. Yeah. Well, thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, you very yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do we stand up and go? Spin me off and give? Yeah. I think we go. Yeah.
Walking alone at night is honestly something that I've been doing for years and it'd be like, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And I would just like, you know, leave and I would just walk about and go like, okay, I'm done.
when I close my eyes, I'm, I'm there again. This weird, crazy, but amazing street where everything goes. We were crying, we were laughing, we were dancing in the street. And uh, this, this beautiful space isn't there anymore. So close your eyes. Si fatta una vesta spullata, nu capilla quei nastre que rose, stiva mieza tre o quattro chandose, e parlava francese, e a così, fui la triera cataggio incontrata, fui la triera a Tulete, gnora si, taggio volù. Recently, I've had the fascination with a black hole. That black hole swallowed up the streets, the trees, the robots, the road, the house across from mine, the mall, that coffee place, the green grocer, the home of my friend, that bar we met in. Um, today I would like to lay down some facts. Something displaying itself as a black hole will swallow the city of Johannesburg. This is known as the Great Highfelt Event. We will analyze this event from the present, as if it has already happened, but in the future. The future will become our vessel to understand our pasts and present as if it has already happened. Black holes are dead stars that have collapsed and of such strong gravity that not even light can escape. 
Unlike previously understood, we are now able to know that the constituents of the star leave an imprint on the black hole's gravitational field. We are now able to know what went in, and we receive information out. Somewhere in time, we are in the past, the present, and the future all at once. Black holes on Earth are possible here. Cities tending towards the dystopic are affected by cosmological phenomena. Thus, the Great Highfelt event. A black hole occupying an, an area of 335 square kilometers. What will have vanished into the black hole is not only the physical aspects of the city, buildings, trees, old industry, new industry, but also those histories and informations tangled into what makes up the city of gold. I do not mean here to imply the city of Johannesburg is a dead star. Her heart still beats, although her foundations are now empty. After we pulled her insides out and laid them on the surface to color the sunsets and sunrises with dust, we planted trees along her avenues. We hid the mine dumps away from our eyes. Now we dig at the insides on the outside again, trying to pull out what little is left. So do not think that I, as the prehistorian, believe the city of Johannesburg exists as a dead city, but I equate her to that of a dying star. I simply mean to say the city of Johannesburg will and has already been swallowed by a black hole. As the only prehistorian to exist in time, I concern myself with that which has not happened yet, and phenomena that which exist across time, not that which has already happened, but that which will occur. I study the future as if it has already happened, history waiting to happen. Although I study the future like one might study history, it remains for the great part volatile. We only know something will happen, however, not when or how. And this, and here, this will affect us. And I look to Johannesburg. Through Johannesburg, I also ask you to think of potentials for your own cities. To quote Stephen Hawking, if the predictability of the universe breaks down with black holes, it could break down in other situations. Even worse, if information is lost, we can't be sure of our past histories either. The history books and our memories could just be illusions. It is the past that tells us who we are. Without it, we lose our identity. If science and study are to understand that here we no longer speak about the truth of the universe through physics, but what might happen when a city becomes an illusion, contradicting all we understand about our identities, if our information building our histories were to potentially and only exist in the memories of human capital flight, those who have come, those who have left, those who will arrive, existing as part of a large illusion in time and space. Demanding for predictability and empirical measure, but thrust into the hands of those who were instructed to strip their grounds of her rivers of gold. We are left with nothing but the question of why. Why what? We are in an age of seeing as believing. What we see helps us to confirm our illusion of the passing of time. Helps us to predict our futures. We see into the ground, and the city unfolds into the present. But what happens when what we see beneath us is no longer there? The tunnels and tunnels and tunnels and tunnels of deep-level gold mining has stripped the rock to build a city-wide identity. Has disappeared and will disappear, not once again, but in the same breath between present and future. The city before the gold will also be gone. The unforgiving but strategically placed geographies, allowing not only the English and the fur trekkers to use the hills for violence, but the Iron Age forges of the Basutus will quietly slip away too. What forges of history are to be rethought if it were already known that they would become an illusion? Our relationship as those objectively observing the state of the city to be pulled under, places that uphold the strong constitution built with the bricks of oppression to protect those today and tomorrow. Each citizen of the place called Igoli will become part of the grains of sand dripping over the event horizon of this black hole. While the future of one place gets swallowed up into the earth, the question of the histories and memories hangs in the air above this black space. Whole entire promises of freedom, change, development, having only just become grown-up thoughts, however already rotting, will be swept into the pull of the great high-felt event. Where are the rainbow-colored promises now? Johannesburg, a home for many, seeking future, seeking change, seeking hope. Not only South Africans, but many who fall into a diasporic life within the city. When I see the name of that place, I see my name written on the page. 
I could also throw myself into the gaping, swallowing, sucking, all-devouring space. What would happen if I stood on her edge and screamed into the dark? Not even my voice would escape her hungry darkness. I'm tangled. There we go. Um, okay, like everyone else here today, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about what to tell everyone visiting the show. Um, and for me, I went all the way back to where my interest in the thesis and the project would begin. The Data Thief and the Last Angel of History, a documentary made by John Acomfra, tracing Afrofuturist sound through time. I found urgency in the Data Thief's journey into the past um, and the imaginations from the future of what the present would look like from there. With this in my mind, I look to be able to critique how South Africans and the citizens of Johannesburg are living our presence and what makes up the essence of our current existence. For this, I used science fictional narratives by South African authors about South Africa, and I called them South African Futurisms. Now I'm asking you to join me on the edge of the city, or likely I'm asking you to join me from the tip of the city in an apartment in what used to be the tallest residential building in the Southern Hemisphere. This building is called Ponte Tower. In my previous presentations, I've asked you to join me from the top of the Melville copies, looking towards the city, but now we're standing within it. Attempting to give you all glimpses of the place I was born and raised in and where I imagine my own future unrolling within. In this case, I found something that spreads deep into my subconscious, a place of expectation, but also the need for hope and a need to be able to imagine a potential future. Here, through science fictional metaphors and notions of futurity, I imagined this dystopia, where nothing would be left but the grains of memory sand. Notions of futurity encourage us to interrupt quantitative notions of time and intersect those predicted fu capitalist futures. This is ever so relevant when it comes to the state capture of South Africa, and I've heard that uh, we've got some interesting progress about that happening within South Africa. Where systemic political corruption of the government in favor of private interests has so skewed potential futures for those living within the, the, the city and South Africa. In my thesis, as in my project, through reading and through imagination, I found uncomfortable critiques. In part, I think it's important we take responsibility for the things we imagine and these important critiques that we voice and put into the world. As a prehistorian, I, the, he, that character doesn't take interest in phenomena like a black hole on Earth and it's extremely unlikely happening, but rather becomes entangled in aspects of something that will be lost and their abilities to get lost if we no longer have them. The dystopia of South Africa, the state of her cities, the chronic skills brain drain, the constant violence of xenophobic and Afrophobic attacks, state capture, the complex waves of nationwide traumas threaten the future of South Africa and her cities, threaten them to a state of almost as good as swallowed by a black hole. I found a position where I thought I could be distant from the potential futures I had imagined. I found I needed, like in The Last Angel of History, to create a character to create that distance. Distance allowed me to critique my own attachment to the city, but also the opposite occurred. I discovered discomfort in the intentions of the prehistorian. The prehistorian made me more attached to the place that I'm talking about. Character, critique, distance, mourning, attachment, and round again to the start. As a before last thought, to close my presentation here, I would like to come with three quotes. Um, as said in the introduction to The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin, the future in science fiction is a metaphor. And Samuel R. Delaney, speaking about his role as a science fiction author in The Last Angel of History, science fiction does not try to predict the future, but offers a significant distortion of the present. And finally, the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion, said by Donna Haraway in The Cyborg Manifesto. Metaphors that help us to analyze complex social realities which exist in the present, while disguised as predictions for the future. I believe the prehistorian, this character that I created, existed in me before I even arrived at this quote in the project that I created. I did not mean for my presentation, it usually becomes an emotional outpouring of distress for the future of a country that seems so hopeless. As each person asks me what's next, I can only say Johannesburg and home. For many, this looks like a shot in the foot. But for some, it is a step in the direction that could avoid a black hole opening up and swallowing an entire city. 
To close off, I invite you to also become part of my metaphor and, part, and be very specific in the questions you address towards your city and the futures of the cities that you will live within. So I ask you to please imagine wisely. Um, and then if any of you are interested, and there's a very ridiculous book that I have at my little podium that shows a very wrong image of what South Africa is imagined as. Um, but the danger is that these might be the only images left. <laughs> Thank you so much. Walking alone at night, honestly, it's something that I've been doing for years, and it'd be like, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and I would just, like, you know, leave, and I would just walk about, and I was like, okay, I'm done. Did you do this? This is low even for you. What did he do, Jiffy? He fucking knew. He knew. The entire climate catastrophe. 26 years ago. What was that? Do not pull that shit on me. You heard me. Uh, she said you knew about the climate catastrophe. <sighs> Just that old argument again. One day, I swear to God, I will finish you, Dad. That's her mom's side showing. Always going on about the environment. Who cares? Oil has always been and will always be the future. Am I right? Yeah. Imagine racing with electric cars. Hyundai! I thought more of you than this. Shit! I'm late. You have not heard the last of this, Dad. Real bad timing for this story to break. I want Miss Green to see my best side tonight. I bet this will cloud the entire evening.
Miss Green? That's Jiffy's bombshell of a mother. She just cares about polar bears and coral reefs. What about profit, huh? You know we got a date tonight? Over the years she's become harder to get, so I'll have to convince her with the green transition. <laughs> Did you see this? Econ's oil pipes are in the news. The whole neighborhood is pissed and the police is running an investigation. We finally got him. Wait, they can't trace it back to us, right? Of course they can. How smart do you think you are? Don't listen to him, Hyundai. No one will ever know. Yeah, Shelly and Hyundai have been harassing Econ ever since he moved into the neighborhood a few years back. Don't know how Shelly convinced Hyundai to do it, but they're in it together now. I just don't understand how no one has caught them yet. I mean, they're far from professionals. Shelly, this time he is taking it too far. I'm contacting him the police. Blowing up my precious oil pipes, are we? I'll drown him in his own medicine. Hey, Dexley, how are you? Shelly, you have to come down here. They're revolting. What, who is? All of them. They even got Kitty Cat on board. Treacherous little fucks. Hold on a moment. What do they want? Clean water. They're demanding it's a human right. They should be happy with their employee discount. I give them 50%. 50%? What more can they expect? Listen, I can't help you. I have a date with Miss Green and need to prepare the cleanup act. Do you know anyone? Does it look like I know someone? I don't know. Ask Apple or whoever. I got better things to do. Thanks for nothing. Apple, he said. Good call, Nextly. Good call. What can I say? Chi is the best in town. She styled me good back when the whole child labor story broke. Nothing anyone thinks about now, is it? I could not ask for a better PR expert. You're too kind, Apley. I just do my job, which I'm very good at. Anyway, when Shelly called, I thought, why not? Always good to have some favors to pull later. Right, everything off. Here. Hey you, kiddo. The old man does not seem to be able to undress himself. Help out. Right. Shelly, she seems to know what she's doing. You must be Chia, head of Apple's PR, marketing. <sighs> yes. I really do not have all day. Hyundai, nice to meet you, racing driver. Cars, huh? I didn't know we were back in the 1900s. Fossil dependency and all that shit. Yeah, that seems to fit. Good, then everything else will as well, right. The rest will arrive tomorrow, curtains, floors, the whole thing. By the weekend, this whole thing will be long forgotten. BTW, you will have to do something about that story that came out this morning. It is not a good look. I'll figure it out. I don't care what you do. Just a shame to throw away my work. Gotta go. Damn. Uh, what just happened? You just missed... What was her name? Calm down. She's called Shia. You would be a terrible match. You heard her opinion on cars. I can go electric. Do you realize where you live? No one goes electric in this house. But the change of clothes and all the talk of a green future. I have a date tonight, Hyundai. Did you think all of this was for real? Well, maybe if you bought it, Miss Green could be convinced as well. Koi? Well, I had to kill his parents when he was a kid. Couldn't be helped. Felt bad for him, so took him in. Of course no one told him the truth. Huh. Funny you would decide on change of clothes the same day as my test on corporate greenwashing. Did you plan this before you knew the climate story would come out or after? I will have a serious chat with your teachers. Brainwashing the youth to believe fake news. What has the world gone to? If I'm a good father, definitely. You should see the trust fund I have in her name. Massive. Not my fault, that means zero tax. I'm calm, understanding, yeah.
Shelly, over here, please. No need for ID. Know anything of breaking pipes over at your neighbor Econ's house? Of course you do. We know what you did the other night, but we need to hear you say it. Excuse me, officers, but I know nothing of this. Econ, you said? Hey, Chubby, know anything about this? Fuck you. And of course he did it. No need for things to get heated. As we said, we already know everything. You just have to deny for the record. Wait, what? You were letting him go? Listen, we know everything that led up to this, and it's not our job to interfere with neighborhood disputes. Some will say it was one way, others another. We accept all sides of the story. But you are the police! It's your job to figure the truth! Fat and annoying, huh? You better shut up or I'll silence you myself. We just need to have a look around for the sake of protocol. Will that be a problem? No, not at all. Help yourselves. Who wants drugs? <laughs> just kidding, of course. Bad timing, purge you. No need to hide it, we know. Just do your thing and don't mind us. Uh, sure. Shelly? Uh, same as last week? Double dose of OxyContin? Yeah, perfect. Been feeling great on it. Happy to hear it, champ. Never let a customer, uh, a patient, down. Anyone else need something? And if that's all, I'll be on my way. Crypto, no trace, right, Shelly? Right. The Purdue guy? Of course it was me you gave Nextel the idea. Started out as a joke between us. Well, now he's hooked. If I took it too far, I did nothing he wouldn't have done. So no, no regrets. Seems like we're done here. Nothing out of the ordinary. You are just going to look the other way when someone sells drugs right in front of you? Not even mention it? You must be the worst officers I ever met. Careful now, dear. My brother already warned you. He can become very unpleasant if you provoke him. One last thing. I'm sure you know of that uh, climate story that broke this morning. Is there anything you could possibly do to silence it? I'll pay whatever. Consider it done. Let's hope this works, huh? Not waiting at the door. Have you lost your manners along with your drilling rights, Shelly? Just uh, opening the wine. Organic, I hope. Where is Jeffy? She said she wanted to talk with me about something. Jiffy? She's out with Hyundai. I'm sure it can wait. Wine? Thanks. So, what's this new style about? I wanted to be the first one to tell you. I'm going green. <laughs> and you want me to believe that? You might be able to fool some stupid journalists, but I know you. There is no chance you are serious about this. And here I was, thinking you would see how sincere I am about it. Don't be such a bore. You just have to prove it. Which shouldn't be hard if you are serious. You will see. Cheers. Cheers, Shelley. I admit, the green does look good on you. No way he is sincere about this. You heard about Koi's parents. Then you know how far he has gone before. I wish I knew what I see in him. Opposites attract, I guess. But that is all in the past now. In fact, I'm dating Amnesty. Now, we share a lot of values, you know? And then, then, when the oil is fully phased out, there will be only green alternatives left. Wind, solar, and we will be right at the frontier. It does sound like you have thought this through, I must say. Who would have guessed? Oil man number one transitioning. I told you, this is for real. 
Not just some green facade to improve public opinion. I'm serious. So, will you sell your Jeep? I saw it still outside. Actually, someone will come around and pick it up tomorrow. Of course I'm not selling that car. I love it more than Jiffy. It causes less troubles as well. But she's buying it. Thank God the officers could make the story disappear. That would have destroyed all my credibility. Hey there, miss. Hey, mister. He is unbelievable. On the couch? Gross! Well, mom didn't stay for breakfast. She was way too upset with herself. I just don't get how she missed the climate scandal yesterday. It must have been all over the place. At least now she knows. I just hope she does not leave the country for another charity project. Ah, and there it is. Mozambique. Great.
。好啦，我哋讀一次啊。快啲 ，OK， 開始。Garbage, garbage, rubbish, shock, shock, enough, enough, three, 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 three men, three, three men, three men, three men, three men, three, three. 100 years, Hong Kong has imported and exported by sea. Day and night, the five-star ferry comes and goes between Kowloon and Hong Kong, providing cross-harbor transportation for communities tied to the tradition of trade by water. The geography of the Hong Kong colony consists basically of three areas: Hong Kong Island, the Kowloon Peninsula, and the New Territory. The communist border lies only 22 miles to the north. There, a lonely communist soldier stands guard all day. Beyond the green hills lies China. Since I was young, only two things have passed. One is to the National Art Museum. 一系去 British Council 学英文。十六岁嗰年嘅冬天，爹哋妈咪特别忙，佢哋忙住想象我嘅未来。五个月之后，佢哋送咗我去美国。喺飞机起飞之前，佢哋已经帮我谂好六年之后我会翻嚟做咩。而根据嗰份工，佢哋谂我喺边度读书、报咩科、读咩学校、拣边个做美。佢哋話：浸完鹹水翻嚟，我應該會唔同咗。不過我冇理佢哋。
是一个很开朗的人，从小我就很喜欢讲话。但是自从五岁那一年，我吃了一罐过期的凤梨罐头之后呢，我就没有再讲过话。妈、嗯、的，因为这样子，所以我朋友很少，想找份工作做呢，也就变得很难。所以我最后决定，我要自己做老板。三十岁嗰年嘅夏天，好似特别热咁。我望住个维多利亚港口楼，点解冇人喺度游水嘅？你话俾我知嗰阵时嗰啲英国人嚟到，佢哋就一条起脚街，就皇后大道。但系嗰啲沙石，佢哋冇地方等，所以就倒晒落个维多利亚港度。咁即系其实成个国际金融中心。都系起起沙石同埋垃圾上面，佢哋越填越出，地方好越嚟越大，维多利亚港就越嚟越窄。我望住前面嗰堆黑色衫嘅人，突然之间我觉得啲阳光好刺眼，我啲眼泪不断咁流出嚟，唔知系咪因为天气太潮湿咧？由嗰日开始，我啲眼泪就冇停过。时候啱啱戒嗰阵时噶，即系，但系呢个 reproduction 嚟嘅，即系重新再画嘅。哦、oh, ，OK， 呢个系啱啱签做嗰阵时再画嘅，即系。系咪唔可以画？收收。我唔知啊，我都要问下。你住喺，你住喺呢度，你住喺呢度。西华，见嚟地上基本单单就系。我住喺呢度咯，即系橙色嗰粒粉。系，我住喺呢度，即系已经填到唔识认啦，吓填咗出嚟个青衣。西环阿婆同我讲系，喺呢度冇人去。呢度，咦，系咪呢度？黄呢度先，沙田。咦，唔系啊，沙田呢度咯，过咗。诶、哎，我睇错咗添，沙田喺度。但系佢哋填咗海啊。系啊，呢呢一忽啊。夹埋咗系咪啊？呢度应该，因为呢一度嗰条系啊，夹埋咗呢度，系即系我屋企填出嚟，即系我琴日咪话赶晒新界佬走就系，但系好唔同嘅，以前唔系。收我知道从什么时候开始，在每一个东西上面都有一个日子，秋到一月过期。肉酱也会过期，连保鲜纸都会过期。我开始怀疑，在这个世界上还有什么东西是不会过期的。妈说了，拿纸巾，让让让。做什么？And territory integrity, taking account of the history of Hong Kong and its realities, taking account of the history of Hong Kong. 好 heavy 啊！真系，其实呢个真系好好衰啊 ！Appointed， 系，佢哋 nominated by， 佢哋话咧，一九年定二零年定一八年
第一次修改基本法，欠咩嗰啲釋法。嗯，佢哋話中國話中英聯合聲明已經完成咗佢嘅任務啦。一八年係唔係九嘅時候？係五十年。係啦，就話、是、已經完嘅呢份嘢，即係歷史文獻，即係依一個係歷史文獻。跟住英國就係個話細油，即係以後油嘅，即係呢一啲係佢。因為佢冇講。中國就話。佢冇講過咧，但係，但係你 resume， 因為佢係講啊，想喊，想紅帖啊嘛，其實佢要點樣處理，字都冇人理。同埋，同埋咧，原來有期限嘅嘢咧，都可以發生。你有冇錫啊？哎呀，你好得意啊，志尊！哎呀，好似开心啫，系啊，开心猪猪啊！哎呀，好得意啊！朗朗唔得咯，好开心啊 ！We only found out his kidney was failing on the day I arrived. We took him to Victoria Park before he became too weak to stand on his own feet. Sometimes he gets more strength. With his bright eyes, he turned his head to follow our voices. Sometimes he could barely open his eyes. We know he's listening to us, and we are listening to his short and quick breath. We have to listen to some of his favorite things. Long Long is so good. Who can eat a dog so good? I thought. 当佢死咗嘅时候，呢啲说话会去咗边咧？嗰日食完饭，我哋两个 X 唔住喊到癫咗。妈妈话佢想翻屋企。我谂，当我哋拣咗要自由，我哋拣咗重新开始。系啊，我哋好似多咗自由咁。但系跟住咧。跟住點啊？原來去到生死嗰個 moment， 我可能唔係我自己想象中咁清高，咁向往自由。每朝起身，我對眼都會好痛。但系已经唔记得咗点解，可能系因为天气太干燥啩。但系嗰一痛嘅感觉，时不时都会喺梦入边再出现。我梦见我自己喺被入边喊住咁讲，我以后都唔会再离开香港。Summer this year is like winter. You will properly say it's climate change. There is a star engraved on this bench. It reminds me of the one engraved on the bench of the ferry.
All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm going to wait another couple of moments uh, and then uh, we'll start just to see if we can get a few more people to join. Um, so, yeah. One moment, please. All right, well, thank you so much for everyone who's joined. Um, it's a really nice crowd today. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit first about who I am and uh, my project and uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So my name is Alex Schwey. Uh, I'm uh, the creator of Non Nation, uh, my project. And um, I'm in between social designer and uh, design researcher. Uh, my project Non-Nation um, is uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. So, first of all, um, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Who here has a passport? And uh, who here has healthcare? And who here had pretty much no trouble gaining access to these things? So um, my project is, uh, about, is a research project about statelessness. There are, about, there are more than 10 million people worldwide who do not have citizenship or nationality. And uh, this means th this is a huge human rights issue. Um, and they struggle to get access to a few of these things that I mentioned, uh, along with maybe education, employment. Um, and so non-nation is a virtual meeting space uh, a virtual reality um, platform where I'm collecting, over the past few days, I've been interviewing uh, stateless people themselves and organizations that work with this issue. And we've been building an archive, as you can see here. This is uh, just a few of the things that we've added in the past few days. Um, so, uh, and the interviews will be added in this uh, space as well over the next few days. So, um, this space is um, designed as a parliament for political debate and especially political representation for those who do not have any. It's a blank canvas uh, and it aims to grow to become the first UN non-state member to represent this 10 million population that does not have a seat. Um, so today is a little bit different than the past few days in case you've seen uh, some of the past interviews. Um, today, I'm not actually going to be talking about statelessness. Today, I'm going to be talking about this platform that I'm using and how we can use VR to bring people together to create some social impact. Um, and I'm going to be doing this by interviewing uh, a very special guest today. So maybe we can move over to our parliament. Um, we've, I have a guest here joining us um, uh, who is Raul Postel. So, um, thank you, Raul, for joining us. Just going to wait a second for this to set up properly. Mm. Hello, Raul, how Hi. are you? Hi, I'm fine. Can you hear me? Yes, maybe we can turn that up a small bit louder. Yeah. Thank you very much, okay. Raul. Um, could you maybe introduce yourself for us? Yes, I will introduce myself. Uh, I'm Raoul Postel. I'm um, uh, working a long time with uh, VR uh, already uh, in this uh, kind of spaces. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, and um, maybe you can uh, follow the slides if that's work. Yeah, it's working. Uh, I have a few um, uh, businesses I run, and it's more social business and technical business and creative business. So I try to combine those. Uh, and um, uh, so I like to do many stuff, many different things. Um, I've started with uh, a, a storytelling, um, a stuffed animal that, where you can talk to, the Vertelknuffel, it's called. Uh, that's something uh, for children who uh, weren't, yeah, uh, can't be heard uh, any time. So that's something we are developing now. It's a social project and we're trying to, to, to give the children a voice who can't have a, have a voice. If, uh, if there's no one to listen to. Other projects I do is, uh, you see that in the middle of the presentation, uh, it's Creative Hubs. I have a lot of technology I share for children, accessible and for, uh, for mainly proposals for governmental and uh, community institutions. 
Uh, last but not least, and that's uh, the reason I'm here. Um, that's the work in VR uh, state now. And I think via the um, uh, we we met each other, uh, Alex, uh, via um, the 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 Discord channel of uh, of Mozilla Hubs. And Mozilla Hubs is a VR platform that's really where we are now, and it's an open source platform. And uh, a few years ago, I I I was busy with uh, virtual reality, and also with Mozilla. And uh, they had a platform that's called A-Frame, and it was some code, some kind of HTML for a web VR. And I like I loved it. And I think in uh, 2016, 17. Uh, Mozilla launched uh, the the really the VR social VR uh, 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 spot we are now in, um, and that's uh, that was really amazing. The, I, I know my first moments in there. A friend took me there, and 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 it it was really crazy. We, I think in in 50 minutes I, my head was uh, overloaded. <laughs> so why do I need this? Why I am here? And and all those those questions were for, were really um, uh, excited about but i i didn't know how to use it uh, very well in that time um so uh, then we get COVID, and you know all the teams and zoom sessions the boring teams and zoom sessions uh, i saw i saw you you could hire a llama i heard uh, for instance uh, to make it some more uh, uh, attractive to uh, <laughs> to have a zoom or a team meeting but uh, yeah, we had this, and um, I thought this this is maybe something we can um, uh, more uh, can uh, um, being together more creative in a more creative way, uh, more uh, in working way, more in exploring ways, and and that was for me the reason to to put something like Mozilla Hubs on an own server, uh, because I had some questions from governmental institutions and they needed privacy and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but also for developing in it and help the community to improve the, the Mozilla uh, uh, VR spaces. And then we met. Uh, <laughs> you asked me to help a little bit uh, with your uh, with your project. And yeah, it's 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 an amazing concept you uh, made uh, for uh, yeah to 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 make a, a land a virtual land for people who are uh, who don't have land who are stateless, uh, as you told in your introduction. So I think that's that's uh, that's one of the big innovative ways to think about new spaces, and really what what's in the end and what becomes in the end we don't know, but it's really something uh, we can use and we we can discuss to use virtual spaces to gather people people. So in a short way, that's that's what I'm doing, uh, and that's how we met and uh, why I'm why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, and. Yeah, so Mozilla Hubs is really um, a really exciting creative platform that anyone can build on. Um, so I was um, in a later on. I think uh, it would be really nice if we can visit one of your the rooms that you created yourself and explore that. But first of all, I have a few questions for you about um, mostly about um, the possibilities of these kind of spaces. And could you tell us? maybe um, a bit more about how these kind of virtual spaces can have a social impact. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's you know, the, it, I, I will slide to the to one of the next decks because I, I had some points. Yeah. Um, I think this one, I, I, we, we don't agree an order, <laughs> but I think here are a lot of uh, interesting things about the Mozilla Hub spaces. You have a lot of spaces and a lot of companies who develop it now. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, we have uh, open uh, the open metaverse, I think. It's something, it's open, uh, but you have also this uh, Mozilla Hubs uh, creation. You have closed, uh, little closed source uh, uh, communities like Altspace from uh, Microsoft. And uh, but I like Mozilla Hubs because it's web-based. You don't need to log in. It, it, there's no ownership. It's a community, mm -hmm. uh, and it's free to go. And they have building tools in it, so you yeah. can build and you can develop it yourself. So in COVID times, we discovered uh, with lockdowns that we co we couldn't met uh, in physical mm -hmm. physical way. So we had to uh, make a, a, a meet each other in another way. And yeah, if you build your own virtual space, you can build everything, you know. 
um, so that's a big advantage. So you can build a discotheque, you can build a theater, you can build an expo uh, exhibition room, uh, all those uh, things, uh, spacey rooms, uh, there's plenty room. <laughs> you don't you don't shorten in room, so um, there's a lot of space and no ownership in the room. Mm -hmm. So you can do whatever you want. And that's that's a crazy thing. And uh, mostly all uh, in education, uh, but almost it's 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 open for everyone every time of the day, um, uh, wherever you are, if you have access to Internet and, uh, and a computer. Yeah. So that's something I like. Uh, we don't need parking places. We don't need uh, uh, toilets. We don't need wardrobes. We don't need catering uh, because, yeah, uh, traveling uh, we save a lot of travel uh, uh, distances um, and uh, influence on the on the environment. So I don't say uh, we don't need to to uh, meet each other in, in real. So mm. Sure, let, let's do that. But we there are a lot of situations uh, in the middle that we can uh, 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 replace with this kind of um, meeting um, and not to forget your own idea of it so i think it's social i think it's saving a lot of traveling <laughs> mm. and uh, you can have a lot of fun together in this kind of space and you see also meta uh, her formal facebook is, uh, is is running out in this kind of stuff too so they are promoting it very well at uh, at this point yeah, I think especially um, for a lot of people here, it might be it's it's really a great platform to um, experience or explore a bit more creative creatively. Um, so um, that's yeah, that's very exciting. Do you um, could you maybe touch a little bit on um, what kind of limitations there are currently uh, with these kind of um, meeting spaces? Yes, of course. Um We'll see if it was this slide. Um, no, this is this. What the, this is why uh, the limitations is is uh, limited to um, uh, mostly to the amount in this in this space. Uh, the web VR is limited to, I think, fifty people. If you want to give everyone the uh, the opportunity to talk to each other, mm -hmm. to communicate with with voice and with video. So then you are limited to a, to, to a, a, a visitor's amount of 50 people. So that's limited. Um, the, you need some internet access. That is yeah. a little bit uh, uh, all right. Uh, in browsers like this, browsers are closed uh, for uh, communication with, um, uh, with the microphones. You, ha you need to give access. If your network uh, doesn't give it, uh, then you can't hear me, for instance, mm -hmm. so that's important. Uh, but you also have other platforms like um, uh, like Altspace and Meta, but then you need to install software and the software is measured and this uh, data is tracked. Um, so you have you need an account. Uh, so that's not a uh, private uh, and this is private. So you yeah, there's no one who, who follows you here. Uh, only the room count can tell uh, this, and I put my name uh, uh, above my avatar, but that's my choice. Yeah. Uh, so um, the advantage uh, or, or the limitations of it are mostly user related, mm -hmm. um, and what you see is um, uh, uh, people have to. Uh, it's a new way of of communication. It's a new way of being. In uh, I think uh, yeah. there's a lot of lot more. To explore than you expect then you uh, um, uh, look to flat screen uh, for instance if you're in a VR glass it's uh, it's more social it's more social you can walk away with someone and uh, just like in the coffee corner and that's the difference you can't do that in zoom yeah you can go in groups and stuff but that's different but now I can walk with someone who's uh, who's next to me here as an avatar uh, and that are differences so um, I think now there's a development and there's no regulation it's all new here uh, what we are doing what you are doing here it's it's never never be done so at the the there, uh, there are endless possibilities but there are also things to be aware what meta is doing now in their new glasses is tricky because they are measuring biometric data from your pupils and from your eyes uh, from your body and maybe your room uh, because they have some augmented reality in it. So what's going on with that one? And mm -hmm. we don't can 
we can't hardly understand what that's going to be about a few years, uh, I guess. And that's uh, that's something we have need to have in mind. Um, but you also see uh, um, what you hear in the fourth uh, bullet here. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, uh, financial transactions going on now, uh, and it started with the game uh, world and the, the game design world. There was a, there's already a community who lives online. Uh, we had in 2001 we had um, Second Life, for instance. Uh, it's it's also a metaverse, um, but now you see transactions like uh, Sotheby's, uh, Sotheby's, how you call it. Um, that's an, an art platform, and they have their own um, um, uh, financial system online now to buy art. And that are developments. They are not regulated. Every everyone can do that. So it's it's free market, and that's very uh, interesting. But also, yeah, you have to look out. Uh, it's it's uh, it's just like gambling, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very new territory. So um, we're a little bit short on time, but I was wondering if there's something you would like to, uh, one last thing that you would like to share with us before we visit your um, a room that you, you have uh, prepared for us to have a quick look around. Um, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, I can. What, what, what I like the most is is yeah, education in VR because okay. it's it's if you are not able to go to school or there are a lot of children in the world who can't go to school, with this way you can gather people uh, and if if they have have access to internet and in most regions they have or they have a mobile phone or whatever and they can join, they can build in their own worlds. They can uh, shape their own uh, education. Uh, we can share the, 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 all the, the, the knowledge we have, uh, not on, on boring uh, uh, long uh, 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 scroll pages, but also in, in a virtual world that's exciting. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's nice. Uh, I, I love to see more of that, and I hope to see more of that, and more schools going into this VR spaces to, to, to renew education. That sounds very exciting. So um, maybe this is a good time for you to share a link to um, the a room that you've created yourself, uh, and we can have a quick look around there. Um, so for yeah. those of you who are just joining, uh, we're talking about Mozilla Hubs. This is a, a virtual meeting space uh, that is completely open source. Um, you can upload uh, 3D models that other people have created on open source platforms. You can. Uh, yeah, meet up with people um, just like we're doing now. So um, let's see if we can join a new room from here. Uh, this is the um, first time um, we're um, trying something like this, so it might be a little uh, difficult, but um, <laughs> we'll we'll uh, try it. We'll just my, try my, it. <laughs> my email was gone. Uh, uh, where I opened the the link, so it's um, now. Pasting it into the chat. Can you paste it in? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, where where can I paste it? Yeah, I, I do it in my own chat, but I don't know. Can you where do you, you can like to paste it? it right into the space? No. Ah, okay, okay. Or, I think it's we're new. we're moving over to the new room uh, as we speak. Um, so this is one of Raoul's spaces that uh, he has created within Mozilla Hubs. Um, we're just uh, waiting for the microphone to connect by the looks of it. So let's see if we can find Raoul in here. <laughs> yeah, you join it? Yeah, we're here. So... Um, yeah, there's a few um, instructions on how to move through the space. It's very similar to video games. Um, and yeah. uh, if we can move back a bit, maybe. Are you here, Raul? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm wondering what what's the best thing you can share you now. Do you want the link here? Okay, and or do we're, it? Do we're we need already to in the new share? space. What, what do you want? You can join us in the in the gym that you have created. Ah, okay. Yeah, I will. I will go to there. Thank but you. I do it in another browser because that's one of the advantages. Uh, the most, uh, if you open other rooms, then this room will close. Yeah, that's all right for now, I think. So I use another browser to to stay in both rooms uh, together. 
best browsers to use are uh, Mozilla Hubs. Uh, sorry, Mozilla Firefox or uh, Chrome. Yeah. And you already introduced that in your uh, entrance uh, in this room. Yeah, I think uh, there's a few issues maybe with Safari, but um, we should see Raul joining in a moment. Yeah, <laughs> just a minute. Um, it takes I'm a little while. Running in, flying in, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the things. You need some patience. Yeah. <laughs> And Chrome is really having a hard time now. Oh, damn. I get a message now. <laughs> Wait. Um, Just open it uh, before the before the call. So but, I don't uh, know why it's uh, having some so trouble So I now. can already maybe explain a little bit about these spaces. So um, this yeah. is a training space that Raul created to um, help people um, explore the... Oh, I think that is that rule. No, that's ourselves. There's a mirror there. <laughs> but um, yeah. so in this space, um, there's this is a few uh, tools that can um, yeah that are uh, universal across all the um, Mozilla Hub's rooms. So we have placeholders. You can place objects in here. Um, Raul has designed a, a tic-tac-toe board that uh, is my personal favorite, to be honest. Um, and um, yeah, it's just different items to um, teach the user the best ways to navigate through the space, um, use items such as placeholders that can uh, be used for um, cameras, also um, any kind of PNG or PDF documents can be opened in these spaces. Teleporting is a function we can jump from place to place. Um, there's uh, other sound um, options that people can play with. Um, so feel free to check these out yourself as well at home. Uh, they're really exciting spaces. Um, unfortunately, I think we're running out of time. So um, yeah, I, I will join the room. Uh, I'm joining the room now and I will be there for questions if you like. And I can stay here. What do you want? Um, I think we need to give up the space to uh, the next project, but um, okay. I will make sure that whoever's interest gets your con interested gets your contact. And uh, for any of you here, I will be available for questions as well. Um, so thank you very much, Raoul. Um, I, we will be Alex. adding this interview in the non-nation space as well. Um, yes. So yeah, have a lovely day. Good luck with the project. Sorry. Good luck with your project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Uh, thank you for Bye -bye. joining. <laughs> All right. Have a lovely day. Thank you, everyone. This is a kindergarten northwest of Kiev, Ukraine, which was destroyed at the beginning of the Russian invasion in spring 2022. The space was recorded by Yaro, a Ukrainian photographer, who used an app on his phone to 3D scan the environment. The software developer Polycam has offered its app for free in Ukraine, mainly so that people can digitally capture their national identity in form of cultural objects and places before they get destroyed. The 3D scanning process converts single images into a visual meta-image. 
This technique is called photogrammetry and in the context of warfare has already been used 100 years ago, at the beginning of the 20th century. During World War I, the German Wehrmacht was already stitching together aerial photographs of surveillance flights into so-called autophotos to get a spatial overview of enemy positions. During the Second World War, it was mainly the Allies who sent reconnaissance planes over the attack zones directly after the mass bombings of German cities in order to evaluate the damage. Even today, these autophotos help Germany to locate and defuse unexploded bombs from the Second World War that are still in the ground of German cities. Many of the individual images overlap and capture the same section from two different perspectives. With a stereoscope, it is possible to analyze the images in 3D. Modern, computer-based photogrammetry relies on more than two images of the same object to create a three-dimensional model. Especially for larger areas of land and objects, such as buildings, drones are used for this purpose. The mass of drone footage coming out of Ukraine exceeds that from other war zones. The proliferation of commercial drones has led to the increasing use of imagery taken by both professionals and amateurs to show the scale of destruction in areas that have been under attack. By being published on various video and news platforms, the clips spread almost in real time and are thus available to people all over the world, shortly after the footage has been recorded. Visually, the recordings are similar. Slow and constant filming of a building or a landscape from different angles. If a video shows an object from many different angles, a digital model of it can be created with the help of photogrammetry software. Since February, more and more of these models that use public videos as a basis have been uploaded to different 3D platforms. Most of them are destroyed objects, vehicles, buildings or landscapes. Everyone with a computer and free photogrammetry software can participate in rendering available videos into three-dimensional environments turning digital space making into a civic-led practice of preservation and creation. Unlike normal photos or videos, spatial records do not tie the viewer's perspective to that of the person who captured a scene with a camera. Instead, they allow for free navigation this also reduces the disconnection between viewer and object inherent in two-dimensional images. In a journalistic context, that opens up new ways of narrating information. Some news platforms have already experimented with photogrammetry, creating settings that users can actively explore. It is a challenge to guide the reader experience, as the flow of information is not inherently linear. But it's also an opportunity to think about new ways that allow readers to have more influence on how they consume information and what that might mean for combining it with traditional news forms. With the help of geo-platforms like OpenStreetMap, Google Earth or Bing Maps, the records can be spatially embedded and contextualized. In the process, the direct location of a place or scene is coupled with real coordinates, connecting digital point clouds to the physical world. This allows for a better geographic overview and reduces the obstruction that comes from being removed from the real-world context.
In this hangar, the largest aircraft in the world, the AN-225, was destroyed by heavy fire. The quality of the model is so good, that viewers can immerse themselves in the site, as if they were there. For people who have been at the place, the model can be a helpful support to go back to the space of the event and recall it in as much detail as possible. It is also possible to analyze whether a statement could have taken place as claimed, for instance, whether a person had a clear field of fire at a particular spot. Of course, a 3D model should never be used as the sole evidence to support a statement, and even less so if the author is not a professional, trustworthy source. But in making a scenario tangible, it can be an important building block for a better understanding of past events, especially for people who have not been there. In open source investigation, 3D models have been helping for several years to spatially analyze events and make them comprehensible. Often these models were created from scratch on the computer using architecture or 3D building software without incorporating photogrammetry into the process, which makes them less accurate and not suitable for an immersive experience. This makes open source photogrammetric models so exceptional. Almost anyone can participate in capturing a space of an event as a digital replica, enabling a sense of immersion that surpasses other forms of imaging. The immersive quality of spatial photographs can also be beneficial for individuals who have had a traumatic experience in a particular space, allowing them to travel back in time. Under professional guidance, they can address the trauma and reprocess it in a safe setting. Scientists in West Holland are researching on using semi-immersive environments in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, so-called 3MDR therapy. Patients are confronted with events of the past, but retain power over how far they want to approach the trauma through a virtual environment. According to these experts, it would be very helpful if patients had the possibility to take a different perspective in order to perceive what happened from another point of view and to be able to re-evaluate the scenario. The environment can be animated, objects erased or added. Personal photographs, for instance, are valuable in creating a stronger emotional connection to the scenario. Other external stimuli help to focus the patient's attention on something different at the right moment, supporting the process of reflection. For more information, visit spatialarchiveofwarfare.com. Can I oh, I'm already on. Hello, lovely people of the stage. Welcome, welcome. And I hope you had a great exhibition. I'm very happy when I'm after Manu because we're also going to transport into different kind of places. So if you want to hear a lovely story about a street that was once there and we're going to transport into, please come along to the stage. Thank you. Could you turn this one a little bit closer? Not all the way. Yeah. 
I'm going to have them deal with the screen while I give a little introduction. Some of you may have wandered in here being like, what? What's happening? <laughs> I am Tirza Kunrat. I, am, uh, I graduated from the Social Master Design right here at the Academy last June, and I'm a social designer and theatrical designer. And what we do here today, we wish you were here, is we're going to yeah, transport yeah. it to yeah. places that no longer exist. Exist yeah. physically. There's nothing we can do. Because in your mind and there's in your memory, it's still there's real, and it's vivid, and it's active. And by do. using theater as a, a technique, we're rebuilding these spaces into the space we're in now. Uh, we're specifically focusing on uh, discovering the emotions behind the growing housing crisis, and then specifically, non-normative ways of living meaning squatting, social housing, and free spaces. Today I'm going to bring you, or Brian is actually going to bring you, to the Almondestraat in Rotterdam. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Rotterdam. Anyone with the Almondestraat? Nope. Well, it used to be social housing, and then it became a free space where all initiatives, in initiatives were welcome. And um, Brian is going to tell you about this place. It's based on participatory theater. Now, don't get too scared. I know some people are like, huh, no, I have to do something. You just have to get up, come along to this side and follow him around the structure when he asks you to. You can engage with him when asked. Um, and if you're inside the projection, if you're in front of the projection, don't worry about it. Because from now on, you are part of the street and you are part of the story. So come on, get up, get along. <laughs> And then I wish you a happy viewing. Well, first of all, uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Almonde Street. My name is Brian. I am the caretaker of KG Kitchen, one of the initiatives in um, Pension Almonde. So uh, I'm going to take you on a guided tour through our community. Um, the Pension Almonde is, a, is an old uh, social housing project which stood out of 53 old social housing. It was turned into a free space. So it was a home away from home for refugees, for people without housing, and for initiatives from the neighborhood. And um, yeah, and a span of two years, we did like a lot of great stuff, uh, a lot of cool things. It was like a magical place, like everything goes there. You can, you can do anything you want. There are no like real rules or regulations. And it's uh, a place where, where people from all walks of life cohabit. So um, yeah, I would like to invite you to, through my story, uh, I'll show you around the block a little bit and tell you all about our beautiful community. So uh, we'll start at our communal living room. So this is the window of our communal living room. And inside we have Flores, one of our tenants. He's like cooking for the street. And there are some people playing in the, on the ping pong table because we have a ping pong table in our living room. And one of our tenants from uh, Austria is working with the, with the router because our internet is always down. So it's a problem. Um, so come on around this way. This is our laundromat. It's basically one washing machine and one dryer. So you can see the problem there with 53, uh, 53 households. Like one dryer and one washer with 53 households is a thing, so you have to make like a schedule. And as you can see inside here, you could you could look if you want. Kirsten and Ben are there waiting to do their laundry because like there are ten people before them. We also have an art gallery here. Uh, this is Jaco's art gallery. He's a he's also a, like artist, so he makes all different kinds of ceramics, uh, and he has his own ceramic oven in the back, and he's spent all morning putting on some light fixtures and railings so to, for the lights of his artworks. So uh, I, 
I see Jaco over there, and like he's he's, he's radiating, he's glowing because he's like, oh, I'm so proud. I put on all these light fixtures. You can you can have a look. Look, you can do just see. See him? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. So come on around this way. We have the kiosk here. This is the kiosk. Um, it's owned by Flip. She's our in-house janitor, and also uh, like she knows everything. She just had a shipment of like obscure books in and she knows all about them and I know nothing about all these all these subjects so uh, she's all into zines and different kind of uh, feminist books and all that stuff and fun fact in the back there's like a secret door to our X bar it's a speakeasy that no one knows about except you guys so uh, where we because we don't have a liquor license so <laughs> so don't tell this but we also have like a lot of parties downstairs there in the basement that no one knows about except us. And come around because here is uh, my spot, Keju Kitchen. It's like the the community center, uh, restaurant, cafe, uh, information point of the street. And this uh, centered red, red bench is actually uh, literally the center of the street. And my son and my daughter, know if I'm Bentley, are playing cards in front of it. And we have a playroom over here. And it's actually pretty dark in there. I'm not actually sure what they're doing. So maybe we should go inside and take a look. Oh, by the way, this is uh, the entrance. And as you can see, my wife is sitting here, Jalisa. And like she's, as usual, she is blocking the path of the, of the entrance. Smoking a cigarette, drinking a coffee. So could we like pass, please? Thank you. Yep. Oh, don't worry about the coffee. Just step over it and come come on inside. I'll clean it up later. Welcome into Kedu Kitchen. So this is Kedu Kitchen. Um, here we have the playroom that I told you about, and it's actually so dark in there because my son Brooklyn and one of the tenants from Germany, Roland, who specializes in making 3D models, is actually making a 3D model of Brooklyn's head. So that's why it's so dark in there. You see these lines over here? Um, it's actually tradition in our street. To, like what you do with your kids, make a line like how tall you are. And everyone that works, works and lives here in the, I'm on the street does that. So I should, can actually see this is my line. And then we're going into the, the living room of Keju Kitchen. So outside, Bentley and, uh, and Nova are still playing cards. We have, uh, on this side, we have a beautiful bench that is donated by the Boymans from Boeing Museum in Rotterdam. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that museum. Yeah, it got, uh, it got re, uh, refurbished so to say, and we got their benches and a few tables. And I had a countertop over here with some display cases. And this is basically uh, the heart of the street. So all fun and games. Then um, I'm going to transport you back a little, uh, a few years back. And then it's Tuesday morning and COVID hits. Mass pandemic, global pandemic. Um, lockdown. No one has supplies. No one can go anywhere. Um, toilet paper was a thing back then. Like, so we're here with 53 uh, units, 53 households, and we hear like all these emergency signs from the neighborhood. They're like, we can't survive. We don't have food. There are like families with Three or four children that have to live for 20 euros a week. And we as community think you have to do something about this. We can't just stand idly by. So uh, we don't know where to start, but we start anyway. And we get to work. We start calling uh, the municipality. We're calling uh, different companies and the supplies are coming in. So supplies are stacking up. Everything is coming in. And remember, we're, not, we're, we're amateurs, we're not professionals, so we just try to do our, our bit. 
And my wife, Lisa's in the kitchen, like cooking like crazy with four pots at once. Um, Laurence and Larcha are like cutting up stuff for their life. Uh, Elisa, who's an intern from Belgium, who has no planning whatsoever about Rotterdam, is using Google Maps to make out logical routes to deliver food and supplies to people. And she couldn't figure it out. She was like, I don't know where to start. Where is this street? Um, Esme is like packing up stuff for their life together with the other volunteers. Like they're putting in food and um, toilet paper, toothbrushes, um, shampoo, uh, hand, hand sanitizer was also a thing back then. So we, we like put everything in the, in the care packages outside. The delivery crew is lining up. They have like cargo bikes and bicycles, cars, uh, skateboards. Some people are walking. Uh, everyone wants to do their bit. So we start. And we start putting everything out and supplies are getting less and less. And the delivery crew is on their way. They're on their way. And all of a sudden, the whole, the whole living room is empty. We're like, whoa. And we go outside back to our red bench. So we sit down there and we relax a bit. And we sit there, we're like, whoa, we didn't know where to start. We had all these supplies, we had all these people in need, but we did it. And it worked. And we were crying. And, um, sorry, guys. We were laughing and we were like dancing in the street, like, we did this, yes. And the delivery crew came like back little by little, bit by bit. And they were telling us stories about the people that we helped. They were like, whoa. The people were so, so, so happy to, to get these supplies. We were like lifesavers at that moment. And this, this beautiful street, it's beautiful. It isn't there anymore. And while, while we were sitting, sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional, but while we were sitting there, we realized just how lucky we were to make, like, in a place where there tomorrow is no guarantee we made like a, a difference today and i want to thank you for listening to my story um th thank you very much this was uh pension Almonde. if you have any questions about the pension Almonde or anything about this project we'll be outside and i think there's a we'll, <laughs> we'll tell you all about it <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. This is just one of three stories. And thank you so much for doing what you do. <laughs> thank you. Um, through theater story sessions, through techniques, through rehearsals, which were only three, um, I gathered storytellers from their own place to be able to tell their own story and um, the hardest thing has been to create a safe environment where someone can actually be vulnerable in front of what once we're one strangers um, we're gonna make act two and three and act two will be about social housing no about squatting <laughs> and act three will be about social housing so we're still developing this and this is a very recognizable thing for a lot of people, losing a place that was once home. So I'm very happy to talk with you, especially, um, let's do it afterwards, let's do it outside. I would love to do it here, but because the next one has to get in, I can't. <laughs> um, so we're gonna move this quickly outside and then I would really love to, to speak with a few of you, if you have any experience like this or if you just want to share something about it or if you're like, girl, I'm out, let's go, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much and I hope you enjoy it. All right. move outside? Let's uh, let's move outside.
It keeps giving the intro, uh, you. There's only the intro. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a wolf living alone in a cave in the Black Forest. He was born a bit differently from the other wolves of his pack, so they mocked him every time they were frolicking in the clearing of the woods. Look at Looney! See how his underdeveloped chin makes his jaw weak and his bite crooked! He'll never be a strong wolf! He'll only be a burden to us, not being able to hunt like we do! How could any she-wolf ever want to be with him? Ha 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 ha! The odd wolf felt sad and lonely. He started to believe in his heart what his brothers had told him. On a cold winter's day, he decided to leave his pack to live in the place where they could no longer hurt him. For years, the wolf lived in that cave, until one day, he spotted a human girl walking near the entrance of his hollow. He hid away in the dark, not wanting to be seen. The girl started picking the flowers in front of his cave, the flowers that he had tended to all these years he had lived there all alone. At first the wolf went mad, but then he saw how the girl sniffed at the flowers and gave a smile unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Feeling his fear slipping away, he quietly emerged from his black hole. Uh, do you like them? the wolf asked. The girl looked shocked and scared for a moment, but then answered, Oh, yes, and they smell even better than they look. Oh no, are they your flowers? Yes, I've taken care of them, but you can keep them. You can even come back next spring if you want more. The girl smiled politely, but also looked a bit wary and said, That's very kind of you. We'll see if I remember how to find this place by then. Goodbye! The girl left swiftly with an uttermost hurry in her step. The wolf felt disappointed. It had been so long since he'd felt the joy of company. And she had been so beautiful too. Seeing her loving his flowers had given him some hope. That for the first time, someone might actually start to love him. Feeling this new kind of excitement in his chest, he decided he'd follow her, percent leaving a trail of where he should go. He followed this path, turning the corner, then the next, until her scent entered a little cabin under some maple trees. He ducked next to an open window and heard a raspy old voice. Oh, what beautiful flowers! Where did you find them? You could not have possibly found such delicate flowers in these woods. No, Grandma. I've grown them in my own garden for you. I've looked after them for months. They are beautiful, aren't they? Oh, yes, they are. Especially the red ones I love dearly. Oh, that reminds me. I had knitted a red little cap for you as a present. Now I will always remember your beautiful red flowers whenever I see you wearing that cap. Big fat tears had started to roll over the wolf's furry cheeks. With shoulders drooped down, he walked back to his cave. He hated her. He had been kind to her, giving her his flowers, which she had worked so hard for to become that beautiful. She was evil. She simply did not see how good he was. She probably saw my weak jaw and my crooked bite. That's why she looked so shocked when she saw me. That's why she hurried away. If I had been a strong wolf, 
she would stay with me. Together we would have enjoyed our flower meadow. She is disgusting. Probably learned that behavior from that grandma. I reckon all the women in that village of hers are like her. And why wouldn't they be? My brother said already oh, that I, my brothers already said I'd never find a mate. Everyone is against me. And why? I am a kind wolf. I'm just not that pretty. It's so unfair. If I can't be happy, then they also shouldn't be. The next day, the wolf awaited the girl on the path towards Grandma's cabin. He saw her red cap emerging from behind the horizon. His heart started beating faster. What the ending is, is up to you, dear listener. What would the wolf do? Like in the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, is he a cold-blooded killer? Would he eat grandma and take advantage of Little Red Riding Hood? Or would he start a conversation with her and discover her perspective of the story? What other possible outcomes can you come up with? And what would you do if you were the wolf? This story is part of <laughs> this story is part of my graduation project. Who are the villains? It is a two-faced fairy tale book with, on the one side, a reinterpretation of Little Red Riding Hood through the eyes of an incel, and on the other side, a reinterpretation through the eyes of feminism. Incel stands for involuntary celibate, and they are an online community of mostly heterosexual men who have communally created an identity around their lack of sexual and intimate relationships. As with most uh, online communities, they've created a very specific lexicon and very specific idea, ideas of how the world works. What is so scary about this new development is that they blame women and feminism uh, for their own unhappiness. So bad even that there have been uh, terroristic attacks proclaimed specifically in the name of incels over the last decade in the UK, US and in Canada. So as with most polarization, the increase of fear for the other side of the spectrum condones violence. So we need to get rid of this fear. We need to get rid of this faceless enemy who shrouds itself behind the clouds. As traditional fairy tales show us, uh, any ca character uh, can do good or bad at any point of the story. So there's a lot of nuance and there's a backstory and there's a complex psychology behind a person's motivation. So this book tries to provide the reader with more understanding of the human being behind the ideology through the power of the fairy tale. And then I want to ask you uh, one final time, who are the villains? Are there any? Thank you for listening. I'm going to take off my mic. If anyone is uh, curious, you can also sit in the chair to read the book. And I'll be back uh, for questions uh, in 30 seconds. So thank you all for listening. Yeah. So the world's coming to an end. On the horizon looms a future that seems to have disastrous consequences for humanity and the social infrastructure that we've come to know. While the prophecies are blurry, a decade, two, 50 years, a century, two degrees, four. The outcome seems to be the same. Plenty of societal unrest, natural catastrophes that are never seen before rate, the collapse of biodiversity, and a state of perpetual crisis. I don't think I have to say much about this. We've heard the discourse, seen the news, the protest, 
the rapid decline of our environments, countless articles detailing the way the climate crisis is unfolding. We know the truth, the revelation. We're running out of time and we have a couple of decades at most to make the changes before it's too late, before we reach a tipping point of sorts. I know that. And as much as I agree with it, and not to discredit the signs behind it, I've realized, like many others, that these major changes and crises seem to be reserved for some rather than for all. After all, right now, in spite of our best intentions or fears, we seem to be nothing more than observers of a sublime spectacle, watching glaciers crumble, crises unfold, and the continued depletion of our natural resources. We live inundated with images of disaster, with data and projections, one after the other. And of course I see them. I can feel the weight of these images. I recoil at the thought of experiencing what is being depicted. But at the end of the day, I'm not surrounded by it. I can look away, ignore it, discuss it philosophically make a project about it. These numbers and concepts and events seem as terrifying as they're forgettable to me. And I think this distance between the image and the experience really puts in question the nature of this crisis and really makes it hard to fully understand it as an observer. There's just something weird about being so alarmed while your life doesn't seem to change regardless of the information or charts. Something off about discussing the certainty of the collapse of biodiversity while sheltered in an art school studio. This distance really makes the crisis feel more like a figure of speech rather than a reality. Even if I know about how dire it is for many people and ecosystems. But maybe indeed it's just a figure of speech and I shouldn't even take it so literal. Perhaps it's just a way of communicating the urgency of the situation and nothing more. After all, we know that these kind of narratives are very compelling, very effective in facilitating a systematic rating of the public sphere. They can and have created exchanges of power and wealth, new policies, inside action, sometimes even tipping the scale of inequality even more. You can also see that the repetition of these images and this course allows for the creation of profit out of them. Not only as we consume them on every possible type of media, both to comfort us and to serve essentially as moral fuel and sentimental equilibrium for those who observe it, but also to sell all sorts of commodities, entertainment, education, technocratic solutions that reinforce the system, Whatever it is that offers to move the arm of the doomsday clock a bit back. And maybe that's still necessary. Maybe this discourse of a dying planet might be just a tool that helps to understand and grasp the situation, not necessarily a reality, and it shouldn't be understood that way. Just a political tool, a narrative one, a marketing one, and it does its job in creating this atmosphere and inspire urgency and fabricating fear to incite action. But having said that, having rationalized it like that, on the other hand, even if it does feel absurd to put things in that language, and even if I want to believe that this discourse is only a figure of speech and not a possible tangible future, these images feel so very real. They seem inescapable, almost palpable. Seeing this amount of rubble over and over again, seeing all these crises everywhere, sensing this future coming, imagining the heat and all that will be lost while I'm incapable of doing much to stop it, if anything, and then the guilt that comes with just being an observer and that I can ignore them if I want to. I don't know, sometimes it it does feel like the world is coming to an end and I can see it. And the fact that... um. OK, 
Okay, to to be honest, the thing that I struggle with the most be beyond this idea of an end and the guilt that comes with the whole discourse is the fact that I'm a um, graphic designer by choice and there's just something that feels intrinsically vapid to me in creating images and visuals when the world is seemingly crumbling to aiding in whatever way to this barrage of media and consumption while there's an ongoing crisis. Or worse, to commodify these discourses through individual artistic practices. And yes, I know this could be true for many professions, and if I follow this logic to its extreme, I would find more than one fallacy. I cannot or should not assess the value of a profession by extrapolating into a wasteland. After all, everything does seem banal compared to global ecological collapse. But nevertheless, the question remains, what is a graphic designer supposed to do when the world is ending? In this crisis, is there anything we can really do through graphic design? It's hard to come to terms with the reach of my abilities hard to face reality that on one hand the world doesn't seem to need more things, more senseless aesthetic production, and on the other that these creative processes based on research or visual exploration on some foreign experience or some distant geopolitical issue seem like uh, an exploitation of said reality to me. Or at the very least I just find it odd that after all is said and done Problems are so easily ignored by the designer, and, you know, not to their fault. It's just it might be just a, exclusively to the benefit of them, whether that is academically or in terms of social capital one or accessing certain institutions. And I know I sound cynic, but take this critique, this video, this performance, for instance. Am I engaging with the climate crisis through design? I'm not. It's just an illustration of the message, really essentially being relegated to the core or a visual companion. It just feels so unnecessary to a degree, almost like an aestheticization of the issue. Sometimes it feels like my efforts should be put elsewhere, but then again, I, I still like design. And yes, maybe you could argue that graphic design manages just to raise awareness, that it shines a light on some important issues by presenting them in an appealing or more understandable way. But well, maybe we're past the point of creating awareness of this kind anyways. It's no new information, nothing that has not been said before or will be said again in the future. At this point, it might just be information that we recycle every so often. Ruins and relics. So what is there left to do to reproduce the same message in different styles with different fonts and stamp them on sellable objects? On, on galleries, on videos, on exhibitions, is, is that all? But I get it, we have to talk about it and we want to talk about it through design. I'm not saying that there's no space for this or that we shouldn't do it. Perhaps maybe it's the only way that we could do it. Perhaps I am downplaying its importance, but I don't know. It also just feels like maybe it's an attempt to reassure ourselves that our labor goes beyond a nice book or a good layout, but maybe it doesn't. I think we might want that confidence of changing something bigger than us, than in, than in the face of societal environmental collapse, we can, can still contribute to a solution from within our profession. And maybe we can't. It's a paradox, really, a cycle. I know that a purely aesthetic design is vapid, and as much as I want to indulge in it, I can bring myself to fully justify it. But then the creative processes that try to be something more, that come from this urgency economy so present nowadays, also seem a bit self-serving, or at the very least with such a limited reach that is almost performative to a degree. On top of that, this feeling is aggravated by a very palpable, present economic reality that forces me to act to compromise, keep creating unnecessary but maybe appealing design artifacts to show my worth as a good graphic designer. 
like a shirt or a publication, a video or an installation. So even if I try to be something more, I still ultimately have to do my job as a designer, regardless if the world is ending or not, regardless if it has an impact or not. So I don't know what to say anymore or or yet. I started this as a way to inquire into the discourse of a future societal collapse because I was scared really. And then the place or lack thereof of design in tackling this kind of situations. But that is honestly unanswered. I don't have an answer for it. I don't know whether or not framing the climate crisis through this doomist language is helpful or not. I do not know if there is a place for design in this era of the Anthropocene. I don't want to renounce it yet, but it's hard to naively believe in it, in the power that it can have or the impact. Sometimes it feels like every option can be condemned as reactionary or not enough, counterproductive, unhelpful, contradictory, fleeting, just a big performance. And to be honest, I think it is. And at the risk of sounding ignorant in these times where the stakes are so high, when the problem is so present, when the future is so unsure, if all there is to do is to perform, to remind ourselves of the problem, to to cope with it, then maybe it's not such a bad thing. Maybe let us at least perform. When I close my eyes, I'm, I'm there again. This weird, crazy, but amazing street where everything goes. We were crying, we were laughing, we were dancing in the street. And Beautiful space isn't there anymore. So close your eyes.